Good afternoon. This is the House Judiciary Committee. It is the 28th of February, 2023. We have 17 bills today, so we're going to be making time here, hopefully, and we'll see how many we can get done. Um, we're going to hear first on House Bill 748 from Delegate Williams. I, I see Delegate Williams there. Uh, I would ask the state's attorney from Prince George's County, uh, Aisha Braveboy, to come up, Kim Haven, Ashley Elias, and Jessica Garth. We may have to add a chair, and if we have to, that's fine. I think we'll okay. We'll hear from everybody, and then we'll go from there. So, Delegate Williams, whenever you're ready. All right. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Clippinger, Vice Chair Moon, whenever he comes back, and members of the House Judiciary Committee. I'm Delegate Nicole Williams of District 22, testifying in favor of House Bill 748, also known as the Law Enforcement Officers Prohibition on Sexual Activity Bill. Um, this bill alters the penalties related to sexual contact with a person who is under arrest, in detention, or otherwise in the actual custody of law enforcement under certain circumstances. Uh, in other words, this piece of legislation ensures that our law enforcement officers will be held accountable for any sexual misconduct in a role that the sole person's purpose is to protect and serve our communities. Um, we in, I introduced a previous version of this bill back in 2021, and I'm reintroducing this version of the bill this session because I feel it is important that we ensure that we protect our communities, especially our most vulnerable populations. Um, at that time, uh, back in 2021, I spoke about an incident that occurred back in 2018 uh, in Prince George's County where a police officer found an undocumented Latina woman um, who... Uh, and basically asked her to engage in a sexual act in exchange for evading a ticket or arrest. Since that time, in 2020, unfortunately, in Fairmont Heights, an officer was a, uh, had sexually assaulted a 19-year-old woman while in custody after a traffic stop. Uh, also in October 2022, a Maryland sheriff was charged with second-degree rape and assault of the individual while in custody. And unfortunately, there are still countless others that have gone unchecked. Since the introduction of this bill, we have been working very hard to make sure that these unfortunate situations do not continue, but unfortunately, they still do. And so, in Maryland, we do hold our police officers to a high standard, and we know that there are a lot of honorable police officers amongst our ranks all across this great state. However, those officers who perform these heinous offenses should not be isolated, and this type of behavior must not be tolerated. And so when a police officer abuses his or her power, it reduces the public's trust in good police officers and completely deteriorates the public's confidence in our policing system. And under this political climate, we cannot stand by and allow the trust in our police force to weaken any further. And we want all of our residents to know that police officers are operating at the highest ethical level um, to protect our citizens. So therefore, enacting this bill will continue the fight that restores our public faith in law enforcement. And for these reasons, I urge a favorable report on House Bill 748. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee for the record. I'm Aisha Braveboy, State's Attorney for Prince George's County. I believe that our bill sponsor has really eloquently stated uh, why this bill is so important. Uh, when an officer engages in sex with someone who's, who is in custody, uh, we can really never consider that consent. Uh, because the dynamics are very, very different than in other normal uh, relationships, uh, either between an adult and someone who is uh, at the age of consent or an adult and an adult. The dynamics are different because the officer has the ability to impact that person's liberty. And so even if it, the the act is not uh, technically by force, uh, the way in which we uh, look at force, physical force, um, the fact is that oftentimes the individual who is the civilian victim in these cases feel like they have no other choice. It is either going to be their liberty 
or they have to consent uh, to the, the will of the officer. Uh, we believe that that type of act, it should be more akin to an assault and the penalties should be uh, more like uh, the assault penalties. Right now it's a three-year misdemeanor uh, where assault in the second degree is a 10-year uh, misdemeanor. And so we believe that this act, which is way more evasive uh, than a uh, act that may be considered an assault, should have a similar penalty. Uh, now, I know that the Office of the Attorney General uh, expressed support and would like uh, to put forth some amendments uh, to, uh, uh, I think we're proposing to move, um, move the uh, statute into a new section uh, of the, or a different section of the code. I believe that the, uh, the amendments proposed by the uh, Attorney General's office would keep the offense in the same section of the code and just increase the penalty. So we're okay with that too, whatever the committee decides, whether it's making it a felony or just increasing the penalty, we're okay either way. We just want this offense to get the level of seriousness that we know it deserves. Thank you. Thank you. Who'd like to go next? I will. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Ashley Elias. I'm an assistant state's attorney with the Prince George's County State's Attorney's Office in the Special Victims Unit. Um, last month, I tried a case against a police officer who was charged with um, first and second degree rape, a third degree sex offense, and sex in custody. Um, in the testimony, the victim testified that um, when she was 19 years old, she was pulled over um, by this officer and his partner. Um, she was arrested as she did not have a valid driver's license. Uh, during the course of that arrest, she was actually tackled to the ground um, and put into handcuffs. Uh, she was transported in a, a police vehicle back to an empty police station, Fairmount Heights. And while at the police station, the defendant, the officer, um, said that she could either have sex with him or she could go to jail. Uh, her understanding at the time was that if she also had sex with him, he would release her car back to her. The reason she was speeding in the first place is because her infant son um, was, had a head injury. So she was speeding to get to her infant son. Um, the jury came back with a um, fine of guilty on the sex and custody count, uh, which carries a maximum sentence of three years, uh, which we believe is woefully inadequate for the offense that this defendant committed. Um, in her testimony, the victim said multiple times that all she was thinking about was death and that she was afraid that she was going to die while she was in this empty police station with just um, the officer who assaulted her and another officer. I think her testimony highlighted the psychological effects of being in custody and also the power dynamic between someone who is in custody and a police officer. Um, we do believe the current sentence of three years, the maximum sentence is inadequate and that change in the law will correct this inadequacy. Um, in addition, it will um, bring justice to victims of these offenses. Why don't we go to Kim Haven first, and then we'll have you switch with someone else, so that's fine. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, when he comes into the room to a seat, and members of the committee, my name is Kimberly Haven. I'm here today on behalf of Forward Justice Maryland and Reproductive Justice Inside. If I had more than a minute and 49 seconds, I would tell you the story about Tracy, who was involved in a year-long affair with a correctional officer, and upon her release, because he blackmailed her, continued to remain in a sexual relationship with him for another two years. I would tell you about Katrina, who was hit on almost daily by a correctional officer. I would tell you about my own experience as someone who, while I was incarcerated, had to beat off unwanted sexual offenses from a correctional administrator. This is not about consent. There is no consent when you're incarcerated or when you are detained. This is about power. It is about power, it's, a, it's misuse, and it's abuse. No one's going to believe somebody who is detained that this has happened. And so it goes unreported. I would also tell you about Katrina. Katrina was accused by another incarcerated individual of having a sexual relationship with a member of the administration. It turned out that that was not true. But what happened to her was she was locked away at Patuxent while they investigated it for six months. She lost four months of her good time, even though it was found to be baseless. There was no apology to her. She was a victim, and she was prosecuted for it. She was punished for it. And all that ever happens to an officer is that they get reassigned. 
that's not enough. People who are in our care, custody, and control cannot give consent. This is about power. It is about abuse. And this legislation will finally write and give voice to the stories that we know happen. This is about power. And for that, I urge a favorable report on House Bill 748. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is Jessica Garth. I am the chief of the Special Victims and Family Violence Unit in Prince George's County. Ms. Braveboy is my boss, and, and Ms. Elias uh, works in my unit. Um, I'm simply here to add my support to this um, and to answer any questions you may have. I would also point out that while we do um, have a strong presence here from Prince George's County on the panel, that this is a widely supported bill. Um, if you'll refer to the uh, written testimony that was submitted, we do have uh, support from the MSAA and other jurisdictions across the state. Um, with that, I'll cede my time to any questions. Thank you. Other questions for this panel? Delegate Kaufman. Uh, yes, uh, Delegate Williams, it's good to see you, my friend. I, I just wanted to make sure, have you seen Mr. Welter's letter from the Attorney General? Yes, and that was the letter that uh, Madam State's Attorney was referring to earlier uh, with regards to maybe uh, amending this bill so that we would be modifying Section 3-314 um, instead of moving those provisions from 3-314 into 3-307. Uh, just talking with uh, the State's Attorneys as well as other advocates, uh, we're amenable to the amendments proposed by the Office of the Attorney General, um, and so we may have some amendments forthcoming. No, I um I'm aware with what former Delegate Brave Boy said, because uh, it's welcome back to the House of Delegates. We work together on special ed issues. Um, but uh, you sort of answered it, but my next question was going to be, um, do you view these amendments, Delegate, as friendly amendments? I do view them as friendly, yes. Thank you. Delegate Bartlett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a quick question. Thank you for bringing this again. Um, so would a someone who violated... Um, the law that's proposed here, would they go on um, the um, sexual offender registry? Under the, under the proposed section, yes. The, 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 the section that is proposed in the current bill, yes. Um, if we accept the amendments from the Attorney General's office, um, I believe the answer would be no. Is that correct? It's so, the, so yes, in the current version of the bill, but if the Attorney General's office's uh, amendments are accepted, then, then that person would not go on the sex offender registry. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just wanted to be clear on the AG's letter because I've been reading it as well, and I just want to make sure the amendments also reflect the, the opinion where he's talking about um, not only law enforcement, but also corrections, parole yes. and probation, and be more inclusive of all those components. Because as your testimony said, we all know that that happens multiple times in correctional settings. Yes. So when you're referring to amendments, you're referring to that as well. Correct? That is correct. That is correct. And Thank I think that's in the current section. It's in the, the current section. It's in the current section. 14, yeah. Thank you. Further questions for this panel? Seeing none, we thank you very much. That concludes the testimony for House Bill 748. We're going to go now to House Bill 585, again with Delegate Williams. Oh, oh okay. Yes, Mr. Chair. I thought there was some folks unfavorable, but no. Oh. I don't see anyone listed unfavorable. Oh, well, that's wonderful. I'm just not used to that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> would you, would you like us to find some? No, 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 no. I just, you know, I just, you know, there's always folks who, anyway. No, this is the bill where you have unfavorable people. Got it. Uh, Understood. So we're going to hear from you, and then we'll hear from those people here unfavorably on this bill. <laughs> Delegate Williams, please. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair Moon, and members of the House Judiciary Committee. Um, I'm Delegate Nicole Williams, testifying in favor of House Bill 585, also known as the Public Safety Use of Force Incident Reports. Um, this bill simply aims to enhance police data collection and accountability about use of force by law enforcement officers and police officers. 
Um, by passing this legislation, we can keep the public informed and hold officers who abuse their power accountable. Um, and this really just kind of enhanced what we did a couple of years ago with the police reform measures that we previously enacted, just um, adding some additional provisions to the data that we are already collecting as it relates to use of force instances. Um, and so with this bill, we're able, we'll be able to ensure liability and culpability from those who have been trusted to protect our communities by altering those reporting requirements. Um, this bill will allow time for law enforcement agencies to establish the necessary infrastructure to publish on their public website and accumulate data pertaining to the use of force by police officers as required by this bill with an enactment, proposed enactment date of January 1st, 2024. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we have been debating uh, session after session, year after year, about police reform, and even as we become more and more accustomed to hearing about lethal police encounters with unarmed individuals, they unfortunately remain um, common occurrences, as we have seen on the news. And so, even by the end of January, seven people in the United States had already been fatally shot by police officers while unarmed. Enacting this bill will help protect Marylanders against those kind of tragedies by establishing more transparency and the use of force data that we are collecting and making on officers accountable to the public. Um, and so for those reasons, I urge this committee to give a favorable report to House Bill 585. Questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. We'll now hear from two people in opposition to the bill. Michael Shire and Michael Davey, please, for two minutes each when they get to the table. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Michael Davey, General Counsel to the Maryland State Fraternal Order of Police. We're requesting an unfavorable report on House Bill 585 as it's written today. House Bill 585 requires additional information that is required to be in a law enforcement officer's use of force report. Uh, that's the only issue we have with this bill. The proposed additional language would require the law enforcement officer to provide justification for their use of force. It goes beyond what's required in the law now. The FOP is simply concerned that being required to add your justification, uh, they may be giving up one of their rights uh, under the United States Constitution. The use of force by a law enforcement officer is heavily scrutinized, as it should be. Uh, today, the Attorney General already investigates uh, officers where the, there's a death or the likely cause of death. Less serious incidents are investigated by the agency, and then they're reviewed by the local state's attorneys for criminal charges. These investigations can lead to criminal charges being placed against the law enforcement officer at any time. These officers are technically, when they're being investigated for this, are suspects of a crime. They are written in a charging document or a police report as a suspect, and they're entitled to the exact same rights as anybody else. Uh, our biggest concern in this case, or in this bill, uh, which we don't have an issue, but if the, an amendment could made that said, if the law enforcement officer receives a direct order from a member of his agency, they provide the justification, we don't have an issue. Because there's already case law, it's Garrity versus the United States, it says that if a police officer is ordered to give a statement, that statement cannot be used against them in any criminal charges that are brought against them. So as long as there's an amendment or put into the bill that says after being ordered, they can write their justification, that would protect the officer from any Fifth Amendment constitutional right. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. For the record, my name is Michael Shire. I've been a police officer in Maryland for 19 years, speaking today on behalf of the Maryland Fraternal Order of Police, also an attorney barred and practicing in the state. I'll be brief. The, the major issue, as Mr. Davey just said, is the issue of uh, self-incrimination under the Fifth Amendment. Line 2, page 2 of the bill requires law enforcement officers to add that justification. That can be essentially used against the officer in a criminal prosecution. We can alleviate this simply by amending the bill to require that at the addition of that justification to be an order given by the police department. There are some agencies that already do this as a matter of course. In that case, those Garrity and Miranda protections apply. Uh, they're both required by the courts, and you won't have any problems. So with those amendments, the FOP would have no problem. But as it's written now, we, uh, we stand unfavorable with this legislation. Thank you. Delegate Bartlett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I understand what you're saying. It makes a lot of sense. What about, um, <clears throat> excuse me, 
would you um, would you allow any other word to be substituted other than the word justification, such as reason or? I think that all falls under the you same think it category. All falls under there? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I, I just think a, a simple preamble to what's written that they provide justification based on an order from their law enforcement agency, that can resolve the whole issue. And if that were the case, we would not be opposing this bill. So if the questions were more like more in line with those that follow that section, where we have whether the, in, the individual against whom force was used was arrested. So these are factual type right. of things. So if they're factual, then, then that would be yeah. fine. Right. Yeah, and the, the, like I said, the biggest problem is the, the Fifth Amendment as to the, just, the justification for a law enforcement officer is where they get in trouble. Right. <laughs> that, right. That's where they could either be administratively charged or they can be criminal char criminally charged. And that's what our biggest concern of, and that's what we're trying to ensure that we can protect. Okay. And so even factual with respect to things of, um, you know, where the force was on the individual's body, that would be acceptable. Yes, ma'am. Okay. That's already in. I represent police agencies all over this state. And if you look at their use of force reporting, everybody does them differently. Some basically just have a checkoff list. Did you use your weapon? What weapon did you use? Where was the force used? There's a diagram of a body. Check where you hit the person, mm -hmm. things like that. We don't have an issue with any of that. It's simply the, juris, uh, okay. the justification. justification. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Delegate Young. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Quick question. Is there any reason that an officer couldn't just assert the Fifth Amendment right at the time of uh, writing down a justification if this bill would have passed? They could, but we wouldn't want to put a law enforcement officer in that position. Uh, if, if they don't get an order, they don't have to write it, but we don't want to just say we're not going to explain why we took somebody to the ground because of our Fifth Amendment. We don't mind explaining it. We just want to make sure that we're protected. By, by putting that, that order in there, you're going to get the statement from the police officer. If the officer asserts their Fifth Amendment right, then you're not going to get the information. So, yes, the officer can assert that right, but then they're going to say, no, I'm not going to fill this, I'm not going to finish this report and add that justification because of my assertion of that right. So you're more likely to get the information you want if you add the, the order into the bill as it stands. Thank you, Mr. Chief. Uh, thank you, Chair. Have you had a chance to speak to the sponsors, the sponsor of the bill about we, some We have language? not. I'm not sure okay. whether our lobbyists have it. I got you. Okay. All right. That's all. Thank you. All right. Seeing no further, wait, there we are. Delegate Conaway. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming in to testify. Thank you, sir. So if an officer is ordered to uh, put this in his report or her report, their report, then what they say potentially could not be used against them in court, right? They could not be used against them if criminal charges were to be brought against them for that incident. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. And keep in mind, that's a constitutional protection that everybody has. Just make sure we got it. Okay. Thank you. Seeing no further questions, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 585. Thank you. Thank you. Now I have House Bill 940. I have Delegate Amprey and Sarah uh, Wendell from the Office of the Public Defender, and no one else signed up. No one else signed up? I believe from my conversations with the delegate prior that there was someone else supposed to be signed up here. If you have witnesses, let's bring them up. But there's no one else signed up on this bill. Can you tell me who you have? Yes, I have Mr. Kevin Lyles and Eric Nielsen. I apologize, Mr. Chair. I thought we had that squared away. Uh, okay. My apologies. That's all right. Uh, we'll go with this panel, and then if there's someone from the Office of the Public Defender, they can come in after you. So, Delegate Amprey, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, happy to be amongst you all, uh, members of the Judiciary Committee. Uh, for the record, Delegate Marlon Amprey here in support of House Bill 940. Uh, the purpose of this bill is to continue to prote uh, protect artistic expression, and the right of free speech, which uh, unfortunately seems to be under attack uh, here in this country, and particularly for certain uh, members of our community and for certain genres of music. So what this bill, just to simply state what this bill will do, uh, it seeks to limit the admissibility of certain artistic ex creative expression as defined in the bill 
providing that any criminal proceeding or juvenile proceeding, the clear expression of a defendant or respondent cannot be used against them unless the court finds that the defendant or respondent intended the expression to be literal. There is a strong indication that the expression is about a specific fact or alleged offense. The expression is relevant to a disputed, uh, a disputed issue or fact. The expression has probative value that could not be provided by other evidence. Uh, so what this bill does is it ensures that someone who wants to use lyrics to entertain, to inform, can, those lyrics cannot be used against them uh, in the court of law or the, any form of artistic expression in the court of law unless these four measures are met. So it essentially puts in guardrails. What this bill does not do is it doesn't absolve certain lyrics that could possibly could be used. So I like to use a, a really, really quick example. If someone were to put a song together and say, I like taking lollipops from the corner stores, and they have uh, several songs that go on about that, and they, you know, lollipops are missing. That alone couldn't be evidence to say this is the person that did it. But once they have more evidence that, sh that shows that, hey, we have uh, additional evidence that meets these four uh, parameters, then the, the li those lyrics could be used, uh, could be possibly be used. And the reason that this is important for me uh, is, is that we have to ensure that artists have the ability to ex express their full self. Uh, we have instances across this nation that my, my panelists will, will discuss in more detail where actual lyrics are being spliced, changed, in order to be presented in the, in the court of law in order to allow for them to be used to, uh, to use admissible evidence. So, again, our goal here is just to ensure that artistic expression can be used in a way that can they can that it won't be infringed upon when someone is expressing themselves and telling their full story. Uh, again, I ask for a favorable report on House Bill 940, and I'll ask that if I have any additional time can be used for the rest of the panel. Thank you. Yeah, great. Good afternoon, Chairman Clippinger, Vice Chairman Moon, and other members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Kevin Lyles, and I'm here today to ask for your support on House Bill 940 introduced by Delegate Marlon Amprey. I'm the former president and CEO of Def Jam Music Group, and I'm currently the chairman and CEO of 300 Electra Entertainment, a collection of music labels owned by the Warner Music Group. I'm also a board member of the Recorded Industry Association of America, as well as the Gibson Brands, a group of companies inspired by iconic guitar maker. Um, perhaps more importantly, I'm born and raised not far from here in West Baltimore. I'm a proud graduate of Baltimore Public Schools, and I attended Morgan State University. My mom, still, <laughs> my, mom, my mom still lives here. I remain active in strengthening the, uh, the Maryland institutions. I served as co-chair of Morgan State's 150th anniversary capital campaign and I led the curation of Preakness Live in 22 and I plan on doing the same thing in 23. Uh, I'm also a true Baltimorean and I have Maryland in my bones. Uh, we're here today to discuss uh, what's happening in courtrooms across America. Creativity and artistry are being criminalized. With increasing frequency, prosecutors are attempting to treat lyrical content as literal confessions. In nearly every instance, the music that they do it in is hip hop. When Johnny Cash said, I wrote, I shot a man in Reno just to watch him die, I guess we understood that was entertainment. He was telling a story. When Freddie Mercury sang, Mama just killed a man, put a gun to his head, pulled my trigger, now he's dead, I guess we understand he's telling a story. Every genre of music tells a story about crime, about hate, hard realities, their environment, dark parts of their human nature, rock, country, pop, EDM, even opera. But yet it's only hip hop, the most popular art form of black music globally, where our art is treated as a confession in court. It's not just a violation of the First Amendment protection for free speech and creative expression. You okay. okay, so let me wrap up for you. All right, so Professor Nielsen can actually do more about the studying the issues, uh, so I'll let him testify to the disturbing facts on how lyrics are used in the courtrooms. But I will say the racial disparity revealed by his research is breathtaking. So by passing the Bill 940, I'm hopeful that Maryland will be the second state to pass legislation to protect the next generation of artists, creators, and storytellers. Thank you for your time. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Eric Nielsen, and I'm a professor at the University of Richmond. Um, I'm here to express my strong support for House Bill 940. If signed into law, this bill would provide long overdue protections for creative expression, particularly rap music, which has been targeted and punished by the criminal justice system for decades. I would like to acknowledge Delegate Amprey in particular for sponsoring this bill. And this reform is urgently needed. In courtrooms in Maryland and across the country, prosecutors are increasingly introducing rap lyrics as evidence in criminal proceedings. 
Rather than acknowledge rap music as a form of artistic expression, police and prosecutors argued that the lyrics should be in interpreted literally, in the words of one prosecutor as autobiographical confessions. Even though the genre is rooted in a long tradition of storytelling that privileges figurative language, is steeped in hyperbole, and employs all of the same poetic devices that we find in more traditional works of poetry. This tactic effectively denies rap music the status of art and in the process gives prosecutors a dangerous advantage in the courtroom. By presenting rap lyrics as rhymed confessions of illegal behavior, they are often able to obtain convictions even when other evidence may be lacking. No other fictional form, musical or otherwise, is misused like this in court. And it should come as no surprise that the overwhelming majority of artists in these cases are young black and Latino men. Our research has identified close to 700 cases where rap music has been used as evidence, but we know the number is far higher and growing, with no sign of slowing without the kind of legal intervention proposed in House Bill 940. Um, there's uh, an abundance of research indicating the highly prejudicial nature of rap music for many people. Um, I won't, I, I'd be happy to go into that in more detail in questions, but let me finish with this. As the research suggests, weaponizing rap music against its creators is racially and culturally discriminatory. It is also an affront to the First Amendment protections that everyone in this country should be entitled to. I strongly urge you to support this legislation and help ensure it becomes the law in Maryland. In doing so, you'll be making a strong statement about this state's commitment to artistic expression, free speech, and everybody's right to a fair trial. Thank you. We'll hear now from uh, Ms. Wendell from the Office of the Public Defender for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. I also come to you in support of this bill on behalf of the Office of the Public Defender because, it, as the panelists have all said, this bill establish, establishes important and practical guardrails for cases where the state seeks to introduce evidence of music or art created by our clients. In my position at the Public Defender's Office, I work primarily with juveniles and young people who are accused of delinquency or charged with a crime, many of whom aspire to be artists, musicians, and performers, or wish they had the opportunity to do so. With the kids I work with in mind, this bill protects and encourages young people to continue to engage in pro-social activities like music, poetry, and the arts, even if they come in new forms like TikTok, YouTube, and amateur platforms. I want to remind the committee that making music and art of any kind is creative, it is social, and most importantly for kids, it's fun. It also can provide opportunities for jobs, clubs, social economic growth, and can be used as a therapeutic, a therapeutic tool to process their emotions. As many panelists have pointed to, one practical protection this bill creates is the requirement that the state show that the music being introduced or art being introduced is not a work of fiction. We know that with youth especially, kids are likely to copy others, to parrot ideas and stories that they've heard from adults or through the media, especially when they are trying to entertain their peers, which is why it's incredibly important that we are discussing this issue here today. I also would be remiss if not to share that without safeguards like those created by House Bill 940, there is a real risk, as Dr. Nielsen has said, of injecting bias into prosecutions, and as well as a serious risk of trampling on the public's First Amendment rights. So in sum, House Bill 940 is a common sense approach to protecting the public's First Amendment rights to freedom of speech and expression, while also providing the state with the avenues to introduce as long as they meet the legal requirements. For these reasons, I urge a favorable report. Delegate Taylor first, then Delegate Tolls. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you both, um, Delegate Ampre, for bringing this really important uh, bill. And thank you, Mr. Lyles, uh, your, you know, icon in the industry. Appreciate your work. Um, how do we make sure that there are no unintended consequences here? If there's a hate crime and somebody's being prosecuted for a hate crime and they have a social media post that might have some derogatory language against a certain uh, race or uh, gender. How do we make sure that that's not going to be used or, yeah, as, as a creative expression and won't be allowed in the courtroom? Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> I think that at that point, based on the, the language of the bill here, it would be up to the courts to determine that that, that expression is, is literal instead of it being creative. So I think that if you are, uh, for, for example, if you are, you know, 
doing a movie like American History X, or you're doing some type of, of, of piece where we, we can distinguish that, hey, this is a creative expression where you are criticizing or doing something towards you know, someone who has an issue with hate crimes versus it being literal. I think that the, 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 the four pieces here that we've laid out kind of give the guardrails as to how the court can best interpret and distinguish something that is a creative expression or something that is literal and actual, actually done uh, with, with criminal intent. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, so I have a, a couple questions, if that's okay. Um, so, uh, Delegate Ambry, my friend, thank you for bringing this piece of legislation. Um, personally, entertainment law and actually sports law is one of my favorite subjects in law school, so I think it's critically important in protecting the arts. Um, and of course, hip hop. I grew up on hip hop, so that's always a plus. So I have a couple questions. One for Mr. Nielsen. Um, can you explain, um, sorry, can you expand on the frequency of cases across the nation and where lyrics are solely being used to incriminate and charge people? And then how often is this happening? And who is it happening to? So that was loaded, but I, I okay. hope you got it. Okay, <laughs> I think I'm ready. Um, well, you know, our research has, as I mentioned, uncovered roughly, slightly under 700 examples of rap mm -hmm. lyrics being used um, as evidence in criminal cases or proceedings. Mm -hmm. We know that is a drop in the bucket, the tip of the iceberg. We know the number is in the thousands, probably tens of thousands, mm -hmm. largely because our, our databases uh, is populated with cases that have a trial record. And as I'm, many of you know, most cases don't go to trial. Mm -hmm. um, so we know that this is just uh, a drop in the bucket. Um, with other genres, um, I'll give you an example. Last year, a, uh, a journalist with the New York Times um, did her own research, and she went back to 1950 looking for examples of other fictional genres that were used in a similar way, and she found four. And in those four, all four of those were either uh, dismissed or overturned. So four over 75-ish years compared to 700 probably thousands, mm -hmm. um, I think that sort of explains. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there is a clear um, racial component to this. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, can ex I can give you some examples of the research, but um, overwhelmingly in our database, what we find is that the, um, the, the, the defendants in these cases are young, black, and Latino men. Very, very few exceptions to that. Okay, great, thank you for that. Um, and if it's okay, um, I have a question, Mr. Chair, for Mr. Laos. Uh, you know, the, the former CEO of Def Jam, uh, my type of music when I was growing up. Uh, so, um, or re rather that record label. So can you explain um, or, or further expand how this practice or using lyrics affecting how the practice of using lyrics or affect are affecting our artists and the overall industry? Um, I could take it back um, because I've been dealing with this issue, but, um, when I see a, a 28 people, um, six sign artists, locked up for a RICO charge because they grew up poor, mm -hmm. because they grew up in the neighborhood. When I see a father of six can't be a father because of lyrics. When I see a son of a dying mother, when I see a crew of people that can't bury their friend that just died, when I see a whole community that saw light uh, in an artist that said, I can be an entrepreneur. Um, there's a kid named Little Baby that um, would not have wrote the song, The Bigger Picture, with, which is our version of Marvin Gaye's What's Going On. But he was encouraged to do that by the person that's sitting uh, behind based off of lyrics. Mm -hmm. um, I can go early days uh, when I first started from Two Live Crew to um, what I went through with um, LL, what I went through with Jay-Z. I've, I've been through so many issues where mm -hmm. lyrics have been used um, against us. What we have to realize that when you grow up poor, when you grow up in a, in a, a neighborhood that there's the drug corn, the liquor store, the church, and your mama, you're going to rap about the, or be a product of your environment. What hip-hop has done for these kids is made an opportunity for them to become products of their experiences. And being product of the experiences, I'm a living example. At 16, coming from Baltimore, I'm supposed to be dead in jail or on drugs. I have a street named after me where I grew up. I built a stadium uh, where I grew up. I give kids hundreds of opportunities. There's no other business 
that will give a young kid, 16, 17 year old, an opportunity to start a micro business. He starts a micro business, he becomes successful, and he says, we leave no man behind. So I need to sign you, I need to sign you, and you're gonna change your life. We created more African American, people of color, multimillionaires than any other form of business because we believe and we come from a place that we did not have, and we grew up with a rusted spoon in the mouth, and now I'm on a mission as part of my legacy to not allow lyrics to be admitted as a, a, for criminalization that you did something, um, oh, because they call you King Slime, you're the leader of a gang. Crime is up. Murder's up. <laughs> but we locked up. And we can't do the very thing that we're doing, changing the communities that have been oppressed. Hopefully that answered your question. That was perfect. I want to thank you for all you do, and thank you for giving our children a way out. So I just want to say, not only have you made millionaires, but you made some good old music, too. So, <laughs> you know, we got a two for there. So, again, thank you. Um, it's good to see you again. And Delegate Amprey, thank you uh, for bringing this bill forward. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, com committee members. Uh, this question is actually for my friend Kevin Lyles, the uh, probably the most significant uh, philanthropist to the Woodlawn community, and that stadium was named after you very deservedly. Um, at the end of the day, I get concerned about things like this having a chilling effect on people's creativity. What would you say might potentially be the economic impact on those young people that you have mentored, um, produced, given opportunities? Because, you know, I'm a business guy. So what would that be? You know, I, I struggle to put numbers around somebody's life. I struggle to say, well, there's $30 million that were lost because of lyrics. And that $30 million we're putting nieces and nephews through private school that they didn't have the opportunity to go to. That $30 million was used to pay moms and dads rent because they lost their job during COVID. That $30 million was paid to have kids to have the opportunity to actually play sports in the league. Because one thing that we, we are, we grew up to be givers because we always had the community had to take care of each other. So the financial impact is one thing. But let's talk about the mental impact. When a father can be a father to a crying daughter, when this is the new form of, of redlining to me because it says, you know what, you're the most popular in music, we are, you're in a black city, what else can we do? When I took everything from you, you know we're gonna take your creative expression away from you. So now you're not gonna be able to tell the stories of what the police did. Now you're not gonna be able to tell the stories of how this happened and you are, and now you're not gonna be able to tell the stories and protest like we protest to bring justice to our particular neighborhoods. So as much as I wanna talk about the financial, I have to ha talk about the human impact that this is happening. It's, it's right now, a guy, Mac Main, went away for 20 years because they spliced his lyrics together to prove a point, and he was exonerated. And I don't have to tell any of you guys how many black and brown people are in jail for crimes that they didn't commit. So I'm here talking about lyrics, Talk about the lyrics, and how about this? Let's lock up Stephen King, let's lock up Francis Ford Coppola, let's lock up anybody else that has the same thing. But because they're not our color, they're not tried in the same way. And I'd like to, to end with this. You know, it's funny, Johnny Cash was locked up seven times, but never was his lyrics used against him. I have artists that are locked as their first offense and they're in jail for one year, two years, three years, 20 years, just to be clear. And we're talking about lyrics. Thank you. Yeah. Always, bro. Delegate Conaway. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Delegate and uh, witnesses for bringing the bill. I, I was wondering if anyone could comment on um, what the lyrics meant to Marvin Gaye's father, as they reported that he said to his son. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, I, I, I know I know the story, but if you could, if, I, I, I think I'd be better to answer the question if you could get more specific. 
what did Marvin Gaye's father tell him about the music that he was singing? Supposedly reported by the media. I, I, I got several Marvin Gaye records upstairs, but I couldn't tell you the, okay. the details of the media. Since, I wasn't, since, it's, I wasn't since, quite, it's, since it's a church on every corner, did you hear Marvin Gaye's daddy said that he wasn't approving his son singing the devil's music? Yeah, I've heard that. Yes. Okay. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Delegate Tomlinson. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so I, I appreciate all the um, – well, you gave – kind of some hypothetical examples, uh, well, with the lollipops and yep. and the references to um, Johnny Cash and uh, yep. Freddie Mercury. I guess I'm just trying to kind of wrap my head around this. So um, I can't remember the individual um, you mentioned just a couple minutes ago. Uh, somebody, with those, I think his initials were M.M. Matt, 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 Thank Matt, you. Matt. I clearly do not listen to much rap. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, little – country boy from Carroll County. Um, but um, so like what, what are they, what are folks saying in the songs? I mean, are they, are, are people saying, you know, talking about murders or stealing stuff and then the police are coming back and saying that that was a true story? I'm just trying to. I guess if you want to totally start case, the he, he, yeah, he, I can, I, I can start with that case and then sort of expand if, if okay. that works. Um, so in, in his case, um, he was an, uh, an artist on Masterpiece No Limit label. Um, he was up and coming, considered probably their finest lyricist. Um, no criminal record came from a family of artists. If you've met the guy, he's the gentlest human being on the face of the earth. Um, one night he was giving a show, um, and there was a fight uh, on the floor, broke out. Uh, somebody was shot and killed, and uh, the police went after Mac for it. Um, even though there was no physical evidence connecting him to it, witnesses saw somebody else who did it, and then somebody else went in and confessed to the crime, um, he was still charged. And one of the things, what prosecutors did in his case, is they actually took um, a, a song, Murder, Murder, Kill, Kill, which he actually wrote, the, ca the, the, the cadence was based on the military. His dad was a, a Vietnam vet. And he said, it was Murder, Murder, Kill, Kill. So they took the lyrics from that song, and then they took lyrics from another song, put them together, change the lyrics around to make it sound even more confessional or autobiographical, and then presented, read that in front of a jury. Now, that, that, that specific example is egregious, um, but we see it all the time where prosecutors will argue one of two or three things. If you wrote the lyrics before the alleged crime, they'll argue that those lyrics were evidence of maybe motive or intent or knowledge with respect to that crime. If you wrote them after the fact, it's a confession. What's so concerning is that this, what we all know, if you are familiar with the genre, stock lyrical references are treated as specific confessions to crime. So you have a, somebody who got shot, prosecutor finds your rap lyrics and you write, rap about shooting. I mean, how many rap songs do, <laughs> rap about shoot, are there about shooting? They will argue that one and one equals two, that was a confession. Um, it, it, is, it, it is very, very rare that you're seeing cases where specific details that somehow skew from the genre overall are being introduced. It's really that if someone got shot and we find lyrics in your car um, that mention shooting, even though that's a very common you know, trope or theme, that will be introduced as evidence. And what we know, to the Johnny Cash example, is that it's highly inflammatory. So we know there's – I'll give you one fast one if you don't mind. Um, there's research, uh, a study conducted – in 1999, but actually reproduced in 2016 with the same conclusions. Um, the, the researcher took some violent uh, stock lyrics from a folk song, just typed them out on a piece of paper, um, and handed those lyrics to two groups. On the top of one, it said country song. Same exact lyrics for the other group, rap song. And then she measured their responses. And what she found is that the group that believed that these were rap lyrics found them far more threatening and in need of regulation than the exact same lyrics characterized as country. There's additional research that shows that this can have real impact in a jury context. And there's developing research um, as well that this is, you know, continuing to unfortunately perpetuate what we see throughout the criminal justice system, which is the targeting of young men of color. So, sorry, Chair, can I ask one more question? Thanks. Um, so, so is it an either-or situation here where is it a, is it a thing where uh, a murder happens and 
so and so is a suspect, and then they find out that oh, he also happens to write lyrics or rap or whatever, and then they use it against him, or is it the other way around? Okay. No, no, it's both. It's, so it's it, both. It, 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 no, it's, it, you name it. It's um. So there, are, there are definitely examples where. Okay, I'll get, there's one from Newport News, Virginia. It was a cold case. Uh, it was a murder. Had you know, five years old. No, they hadn't found anybody. Um, all of a sudden, um, the police and the gang unit unearthed a rap video um, that they thought was somehow confessional, even though the details to the song were no, were way off. Um, and so that motivated their prosecution of this particular person five years later. That's one example. More common is that you have a suspect, and then you're looking for whatever and I put, use air quotes, evidence you can find um, to make a, a conviction stick, and that's very common. So then you'll go back, you'll go through that person's hard drive, cell phone, whatever, and if you see rap lyrics or you see them up on YouTube or in SoundCloud, you will then bring that in, even though you're not supposed to bring in things that are character evidence, um, uh, the prosecutors will argue that it is evidence of motive intent or that it's straight up confessional. So it, it, it runs the gamut. All right. Uh, interesting. Thank you. I appreciate it. Further questions for the panel? Delegate Schmidt. I do appreciate the testimony. I'm, 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 thank you, Chair. I'm really struggling with this one. I, I really am. I mean, I grew up, I grew up in the city suburbs, listening to the 90s rap music, the explicit lyric days, right, the, the label that we put on these, these albums. But I'm struggling with when a, Artist uses murder, murder, kill, kill, or or steal. Or I mean, I'm I'm really struggling with this. I mean, because it's perpetuating others to commit those types of acts. I mean, I'm, I'm I'm really struggling with this a little bit. I mean, and if we're giving somebody a free pass to, I, I get what you're saying about using it against them, but a free pass to to say these things. It, it, how does that affect a, a, a neighborhood or a genre? Or I mean, I, I'm struggling with that. Well, I, I'll first say I, I don't think it's a free pass. It's a constitutional right to have free speech. Sure. Second thing I would say in regards to the neighborhood, I would ask us to examine the neighborhoods before we start blaming hip hop. Well, let's 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 consider the other elements that contribute to what poverty, uh, uh, the original form of redlining, you know, underinvested schools. And I think the other thing is, you know, as as I think my panel has eloquently said. You know, a lot of times these artists are giving you a depiction of the reality that they face. I mean, I can say wholeheartedly that, you know, hip-hop really changed my life, you know. <clears throat> I spent my summers in West Baltimore. I didn't get a chance to travel. But hip-hop allowed me to hear from people in Compton, Brooklyn, New Orleans, Houston. I mean, even I learned how the wards worked in Houston because of hip-hop, right? I didn't know how th th things worked there. But ultimately, what hip-hop has done is it allows us to hear the struggle and, and the fight that people are dealing with. A lot of artists are just expressing the realities that they face every day. So I don't think that it's necessarily encouraging uh, lyrics. I think it's more so the expression of, of what's going on and what's happening. I think sometimes when we hear these lyrics, it can also, also inspire us to do some things that can change the conditions that people are living in. But I think ultimately, um, again, the spirit of this bill is to ensure that um, the lyrics being used by individuals as they're describing the situations that they lived in or just describing things they see, that it's not indicting them uh, for, for, for their freedom of expression. So uh, I hope that answers your question to a certain degree. It, it does. I, pr I appreciate yeah. the elaboration. It really does help. Could I address it briefly? Sure. It's up to the chair. Did you want to? Yeah, I just want to say uh, I am 90s hip hop. You're looking at 90s hip hop. But the same way um, NWA said F the police. I'm I love glad that. you brought that up because that's something. I, 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 I love that as much as, uh, as Ice Cube grew up and he said today was a good day. You, you can't, you, you, you can't um, when you say you grew up on it, you listen to it, uh, we have people who lived it. And when you're in that life, yeah, today might have been a good day. But yesterday, when you, you were on the ground with your hands behind your back saying you got a gun in the car, with a gun into your head, and they said, oh, wrong person, wrong car. So those realities happen, and it's not just music. This is, this is really true life. And yeah. to, to tell you about somebody saying uh, murder, 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 kill, kill, kill. How many of us have been murdered, 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 and killed, killed, killed because of the color of our skin? So it's not, this is, this, I, I, maybe it's a disconnect in, um, it's, I don't think it's the music, it's in the realities of our country that black and brown people are targeted, black and brown people are boxed, black and brown people are, are oppressed, black and brown people are not put in situations that they have opportunity. And the very music 
that gives them opportunity is under attack today. Thank you. I would just, I wanted to address briefly your, the sort of premise of your question. I mean, the first, uh, there isn't any real evidence that creating violent artistic themes causes people to go commit violent acts. I mean, we don't believe that uh, video games, horror movies, any of these things are causing us when we watch them to go out and kill people, for example. It, but I would say that I would take it a step further. Even though there are some violent lyrics like murder, murder, kill, kill, and, and I should say that the rest of the line was just real on the battlefield. It's about war. Um, it's that uh, w the story of hip hop is not one where even with violent lyrics, you're seeing communities being harmed or ravaged by this. It's the opposite. I mean, the narrative of hip hop is very different from what I think many of us are exposed to. If you think about the 1970s in the South Bronx, overrun by criminal street gangs, some of the early founders of hip hop specifically saw hip hop as a way to take some of the territoriality and competitiveness and, and, and aggression of gang life and transform it into something artistic and productive. I've worked on over a hundred cases involving rap as evidence, and in the overwhelming majority, what the defense will tell what we'll say what these young men these are kids they're somebody's son okay what they will say is I did this to get out of these circumstances rap is my anti-drug it's the thing that kept me off the streets it's the thing that kept me productive so if doing if, if expressing yourself with violent themes is what you do you know I don't know that as a, a society we can really judge given how we are so tolerant of violent themes in all of our other popular culture Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, um, could I also have the opportunity to respond? I apologize, I'm not used to the Zoom format. Go ahead. Uh, just briefly, um, I also wanted to respond and just point out that um, what I think that this bill does well is it's focusing in on the rules of evidence and in these situations where we have a First Amendment right to freedom of speech, freedom of expression, we really do have to be careful where the right, our rights bump up against each other to make clear rules where courts have to make clear findings. And in any case, in any trial, the evidence that has to be put on must be relevant. And in this case, when we're looking at freedom of speech, freedom of expression, art and music, this bill does well to create clear findings that courts would have to go through where not only are we looking at if the statements, the lyrics are relevant, we're also looking at, you know, are we also protecting other constitutional rights for folks who might be on trial that day? Um, and so I think this rule, this pro proposal does well to really lay that out in a way that still allows lyrics to come in in situations where those requirements are met, but really just make sure that courts are making clear findings when this does come up. Mr. Chair, that was my question and answer. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Wendell, would you say that the current law with regard to a statement that's made by a party opponent is not clear? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I wouldn't say that. I would say that this is a situation where we're looking at people's First Amendment rights. We're looking at music, we're looking at art. It's a bit different than a traditional party opponent statement that we typically see in courts in different proceedings and especially where someone else's constitutional right, a different right is involved. We have to make sure that we're making clear findings and taking extra precautions to make sure that those every right is being upheld in that criminal setting. Are there other questions for the panel? Seeing none, thank you all very much. That oops, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 940. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate you applauding my you, voices. Thank, thank you all. We're going to House Bill 959 now. Oh. Delegate Metzger. And it's just Delegate Metzger. Head for three minutes, please. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. House Bill 959, Procedure Plea Agreement, Crime of Violence, today, February 28th. Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the Judiciary Committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. I'm Delegate Rick Metzger, for the record, who is sponsor of House Bill 959. 
59. I introduced this bill because of a constituent and a mother whose son's life was taken very soon. Ms. Kim Rivers could not be with us today uh, to discuss what had happened to the, the son, that, the, the gentleman that took their son's life, but uh, two teenagers basically shot and killed her son over a dirt bike. And um, the father had looked out and seen the, for the back record, the father had looked out and seen the shed light on, and he called and said to the son, go down and turn the shed, the light off in the shed, and went down there. He was assaulted and murdered. Um, tragically, uh, the uh, the assailant is scheduled for early parole um, this year, and um, the purpose of this bill is again, as I mentioned, a 20-year sentence. Uh, we talk about crime that's been really in front of us for for some time, and we talk about trying to do something about crime and the slowdown of violence. I truly believe that we need to begin the dialogue of a message. And the message is, if you do the crime, as Ivan Bates said, bring your toothbrush, you're going to jail. And I truly believe that uh, I'm, you're looking at a man of faith and a man that believes in forgiveness and believes in first chance, second chance, third chance, fourth chance, fifth chance. But there is times that we need to say enough is enough. And um, this bill, I, I'm open to amendments. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you and I have talked about this since I introduced it back in 2019 that a, a person that had commits a crime, that the plea bargain arrangement, and if they go back out and do a crime again, I truly believe that they need to go back to the original crime, the sentence that was originally sentenced for that person, and do that. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, that if we, as legislators and leaders, that if we stand up and say enough is enough and we are here to do this and saying, and this is what happens, somewhere along the line. I'm reminded of a sentence from years ago when I worked for a security company and they said that uh, the FBI says that if a criminal is about to commit a crime and he's been detected before he commits the crime, he'll not commit the crime. I truly believe also, ladies and gentlemen, that if it's in the back of your mind that this crime could get me 30 years in jail, I believe I'm not going to commit that crime. So, ladies and gentlemen, I respectfully ask for a favorable request on House Bill 959. Thank you. Any questions for the delegate? Delegate Kaufman. Uh, thank you, Delegate Metzger. It's really nice to meet you. I'm a freshman, so I don't believe we've had the pleasure of meeting, but thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. It's uh, my honor. Uh, do you have, and uh, you have a wonderful district mate in Delegate Grammar, but do you have any evidence, sir, that, uh, do you have any evidence, sir, that knowing, hey, I'm going to, do you have data that suggests that um, knowing I'm going to get 20 or 30 years um, is a deterrent for criminals if it, in fact, is there data that suggests Johnny, who may, thinks uh, maybe mur murdering Molly, but won't because he knows he's going to get 30 years. And secondly, plea deals, and uh, my wonderful chairman probably knows more about this than I do. In fact, I know he does. Um, but uh, plea deals are often used by state's attorney's office because of an extreme backlog of cases. So um, have you thought, talked, uh, talked about how, have you thought about how you can mitigate uh, the increased workload that would result uh, from this for the Thank state's you. attorneys all across the state, Delegate? Thank you for that question. I was uh, approached earlier today, and the gentleman said, well, Delegate, that bill means that the lawyers are actually going to have to do some casework. The answer to that is, yes, that's true. Uh, I truly believe that the state's attorneys or the prosecutors who do these negotiations I believe sometimes it's because of the backlog, and yes, uh, I realize that this could take some time, but I believe if we implement it, I believe the backlog would slow down, and I believe we'd have less people in the prisons. Yes, uh, how about my first question, Delegate, about do you have any data that... I, that not in front of me, no, sir. Oh, uh, could you... I'd be very interested be, if I'll, you could I'll, research it, thank you. I will get you some research for that. Because I want to know if, in fact, it's a deterrent or... It, uh, it, just something we would like to believe that it's a deterrent. Thanks. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Delegate Mesker. 
Oh, there you are. <laughs> Thank you uh, for bringing this bill. Uh, violent crime is a very serious issue, and it's especially close to my heart. And just to Delegate Kaufman's uh, question, um, a few hours ago, I actually met with State's Attorney Ivan Bates, and he shared some fascinating research that has been done at the federal level over the past 20 years that showed um, increase in time given for violent crime is actually a deterrent after the five-year point. Yes. So once it's five years and up, um, you start to see the deterrent effect take take effect. And so I would be happy to share that with you, along with Delegate Kaufman. Isn't that so? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And briefly, this is about <clears throat> the murder that happened to the Rivers family some years ago. Yes. Uh, I, uh, can you tell me, you know, I know Ms. Rivers couldn't be here today. Can you, I know you know them personally. Can you tell me how this impacted the family, the parents of uh, Mr. Rivers? Well, first of all, um, let me just say this. Can you imagine the father that looked out and saw a light on? and told his son to go turn the light off in the, the garage. Can you imagine in almost 17 years what he's thought when he looks at that garage? If I'd only told my son not to turn the light out, if I wouldn't have said turn the light out, my son might be here. Mrs. Rivers has struggled very difficult. She has fought all the way through to keep this gentleman, and I call him a gentleman because I believe in the, the, the rehabilitation. But she is struggling and she's having a very, very difficult time, especially know that he could possibly get out in a few days. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Delegate, for being here. Um, I just, first off, want to say I, I do wonder and question the workload that this would put on the state's attorneys. I used to work in the state's attorney's office. Each and every prosecutor has piles and piles on their desk. You see one of these on grandma's desk, it's like six of them. <laughs> um, so my question, though, for you, Delegate, is like, like who, who is at issue here? Are we concerned that the state's attorneys are not holding folk? Are you concerned that judges are not giving sentences uh, to your liking? I just want to get some clarity. I think we're letting the criminal off. Because the criminal knows that... Well, to clarify, who is we? That's my question. The criminal? Who is, is we that we that is letting the criminal off? Who is the criminal? Who is the we that is letting the criminal the, off? The we? I would like to say us, but it can't be us unless we take the leadership in the role and say enough's enough. But I will say that the criminal is being let off because, again... The prosecutors, the state's attorneys, they're concerned about their caseload. They're concerned, quite honestly, of, of where they're going and, and how least, the least of work. And again, they're, they're burdened. But I believe if we start the process and say enough's enough, that caseload will go down. So would you, do you think that crime is going to go down? When you send a strong message and that person knows that he's going to go to jail for a long time, I believe so. Let me just give you a little example. Now, I know this is Hold on, hold on. I don't, want to, I don't want to use up all my committee's time. Right, I sure. asked a lot of questions, so I just want to be mindful of that. So my last question, uh, again, you know, I just don't – your rationale is that we're going to increase the load dramatically for everybody, maybe clog the system – which would then, A, cause folks to be held longer pretrial for a very long time. It'll cause the judges to have a much larger backlog. I mean, I just would want to get a more clearer picture on how we overcome that hump Delegate to get to, your, to what you are projecting. And then I would also really just question where the data would come from. I read the Judiciary Committee's report. They're very concerned about judicial economy. They're concerned about constitutional concerns. So I would just, I don't want to, again, use up too much of my committee's time, but I just really think that it's difficult for me to rationalize how you reduce the caseload by increasing the caseload so dramatically 
with this bill. Thank you, let, Mr. Chair. Let, let, me, let me say it this way. Many of you are attorneys. I'm a salesman. My job is to sell this product, and this product is to stop crime. And the way we can, if it starts with conversation, it starts with conversation. It starts with adding amendments, taking stuff away, putting it in. That's how, ladies and gentlemen, we get the job done, working across the lines, working together. And put your hands together, and we get this job done. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Last question for this bill. Delegate Metzger, um, I do appreciate the fact that regardless of the economic impacts and complaints about people's workloads, um, you're just here to curb violent crime and save lives in the state of Maryland. And I know you were cut off from answering uh, the previous question, so I was hoping you could go ahead and, and give us your full answer. Let me just say this again, that we're here as leaders and legislators. We're the lawmakers. And I believe that for 445 years, there's been a law somewhere along the line that's come through. I learned a long time ago, delegates, not to fall in love with my bills. This bill started in 2019. So I've got time. I would love to work on this bill to make it go through to the third reader and to vote. But unless you feel it's not ready, I'm honest enough to tell you, let's work together. My office number is 841-3332. You can call me anytime. You can call me on my cell phone, 443-622-7647. I'm available to get the job done. Bottom line. Seeing no further questions, Delegate Conaway. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Delegate, for coming in. Uh, I understand that you're a salesman. And you said your rationale for we slash us is that you're tired of abduction, arson, kidnapping, manslaughter, mayhem, maiming, murder, rape, robbery, carjacking, armed carjacking, sexual offenses, so forth and so on. Is that correct? It's happening all over. You're tired of this. Is that yes. correct? Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. I want to ask a question. Delegate, if someone uh, pays a speeding ticket, is that considered a plea agreement? A speeding ticket? No, because that cameras now. No, it's considered a plea agreement okay. because you're pleading guilty to a crime, and that means that that would have to be tried. Okay. Does that mean that literally every citable offense would have to be tried if a person in their past had committed a crime of violence? If it's listed in here, that's what it is. That's what it would be. Every single one. Thousands of them. Statewide. Well, that'll show them. That concludes the testimony for House Bill 959. Thank you very much, Delegate Metzger. We're going to move next to De House Bill 801, Delegate Attar. Thank you. And we have three people testifying in favor, Delegate Attar, Deborah Haskins, and Lakita Carter. And we will hear from you right now. Go ahead, Delegate Attar. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members. For the record, I'm Delegate Dahlia Attar, here presenting House Bill 801, Criminal Injuries Compensation Board, Eligible Individuals, and Direct Reimbursement for Mental Health Services. Several months ago, I think it's been about seven months now, a dear constituent of mine, Ms. Haskins, reached out to me. And she brought up concerns with the current statute when it, around Criminal Injuries Compensation Board. She told me her personal story, which you will hear shortly. Um, and we've been working on this for quite a while now. This bill changes those eligible for awards from the Criminal Injuries Compensation Fund to include a parent, a child, a stepchild, a sibling, or an intimate partner of a victim who received psychiatric, psychological, or mental health counseling due to the injury to the victim. And those services must be provided without charge to the individual and rather be paid for by the Criminal Injuries Compensation Board. I can go on for a very long time about why mental health services are necessary for 
many people, uh, but specifically when it comes to those who are victims of crime, it is absolutely necessary. I will um, save some time so my panel can talk a little bit more about this, but I just want to point out that this bill also, like I mentioned at first, expands who is eligible, um, and you will hear why that is necessary as well, and I'm open for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Good afternoon, Delegate Klimberger and members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Dr. Deborah G. Haskins. I am a lifelong resident of Baltimore City. Today I am here representing our son, Joseph Jojo, and our nephew, Reuben Haskins. They are not homicide numbers. They are loved. They have families. They had dreams. I re represent all families affected by criminal injuries. I thought homicide happened to other people until it happened to us. In the state of Maryland, there is a lack of advocacy for criminal injuries assistance. How do I know? Because we were not contacted by the state until five years later. I learned from another mom of a murdered son. The proposed bill has two components. First, we must expand who qualifies. JoJo's fiance, his stepson, and JoJo's and Ruben's siblings did not qualify. Second, the current law provides up to three years of counseling, but it is a reimbursement model. This is unacceptable. The current law discriminates against persons who have limited material resources to first pay for counseling and then wait to get your money back. It took eight months for us to be reimbursed and we just stopped. I'm asking that you please, please, vote for this bill so that every victim in the state of Maryland can get the compassionate care right from the start. Allowing them to breathe with the supports available in their communities without searching. We become a state and a world of more people who love and who learn to live and love again. My prayer is that every victim of criminal injury sees Maryland as a state of hope and healing. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Lakita Carter, and I am, um, I hold three licenses in the state of Maryland, mental health licenses, the highest of which is a, a licensed psychologist. I'm the owner and CEO of the Institute for Healing, where we see about 300 patients a week and offer trauma and grief support to those patients. Um, so I think that what's important for you to know is that, um, you, and what you might already know, that in 2020, um, Maryland had 649 homicides, and half about, about half of those were in Baltimore, my hometown. And you might know that families are affected by homicide as well as communities. Um, so I think it might be more impactful if I share with you um, what would happen if you don't support this bill. If you don't support this bill, you have family members who won't receive the necessary mental health treatment that they need. Um, and they, that means that they will continue to go untreated. Symptoms like depression, anxiety, substance use, sleeplessness, irritability, frustration, um, anger, that, that will show up in our homes, that will show up in our schools, that will show up in our places of worship, that will show up in our communities, in our stores, um, and in our neighborhoods. Uh, and that's not something that we, that's something that we can help, that we can change. Also, I think it's important for you to know that if you don't support this bill, um, mental health services will be, will continue to be only for, or will continue to be only for people who are economically privileged. And that's also not something that we want to support. Um, it's important that uh, mental health services be provided to all Marylanders, I mean, everybody in our country, but in this case, all Marylanders, so that we can create a healthier uh, community. So um, in closing, I just want to remind you that um, we have been, sp we spent a lot of time uh, decreasing stigma against mental illness, and I think the most, the biggest injustice that we could create is to take a group of people who've already experienced loss and trauma and re-traumatize them by denying them access to mental health services. Thank you. Are there questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. That concludes the testimony on House Bill 801. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Um, we're going to hear now from Delegate Wells in House Bill 746. And I understand that we're going to have to hear the two Baltimore City bills right after that. So there's a little change in the lineup where we're going to 
hear uh, 632 and 613 before we hear House Bill 44. So we'll do 746 now, and then um, we'll move to seven, uh, 632. So Delegate Wells, Christopher Dews, Jason Billingsley. Do we have uh, Janet Graham and Stanley Mitchell virtually? Just Janet. Okay, so we'll take Janet Graham on, this, on the screen, and we'll start with Delegate okay. uh, Wells, who's I Thank don't you. see Jason Billingsley, so no? Okay. Well, we'll get started. Thank All right. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and, and members of the committee. For the record, I am Delegate Wells. I'm here today presenting House Bill 746 um, as a means of removing acquittals, dismissals, and all pros from public view. In 2021, this committee passed legislation to allow this same section of non-convictions to be automatically eligible for expungement after the three-year statute of limitations. House Bill 746 is a continuation of all that work from a different angle. A criminal record can be both the cause and consequence of poverty. Lower income workers and job seekers are routinely denied employment, housing, and educational opportunities because of a criminal record. More than 85% of employers perform background checks on all job applicants and deny employment to many citizens based on a record. A past criminal conviction of any sort reduces job offers uh, by half. Worse yet, in Maryland, a criminal record is acquired upon arrest, whether or not a person is ever convicted of a crime. Anything that occurs after an arrest is documented on an individual's criminal record and in Maryland will remain publicly visible via Maryland case search until the charges and dispositions are expunged. There is no valid reason that charges that did not result in a conviction, specifically acquittals, dismissals, and all pros, should vo visibly remain and the public record. However, Maryland's current law inadvertently replaces the innocent until proven guilty standard with an, uh, with an unjust guilty even if proven innocent standard. Uh, in Maryland, charges that did not result in a guilty conviction, i.e. non-convictions, are eligible for expungement three years after your case is decided. One may file for expungement earlier if they also sign a general release and waivers of all legal claims preventing them from suing the police department for possible misconduct. Additionally, under the current Maryland law, charges that arise from the same incident, transaction, or set of facts are considered a unit of charges. If a person is not entitled to the expungement of one charge or conviction within a unit, the person is not entitled to expungement of any other charge within the unit. Um, so this prevents many non-convictions from being eligible for expungement via obliteration. According to Maryland Code, Criminal Procedure 10-101, expunge means to remove information from public inspection in accordance with this subtitle. Inspungement with respect to a court record or a police record means removal from public inspection, one, by obliter obliteration, or two, by removal to a separate secure area to which persons who do not have legitimate reason for access. Um, so while we're more familiar with this first option, this bill is seeking to, um, to really build upon the second option. A rational compromise could be made wherein expungement via storage, provision two, is used for non-convictions during the three-year expungement waiting period. This way, only the courts will have legitimate access to the charges for proceedings related to that charge, and Marylanders not found guilty of a charge won't have it used against them on the, the case search. So it is with that that I ask for a favorable report on House Bill 746. Thank you. Sir, so uh, Christopher Dews representing the best interests of the Job Opportunities Task Force as well as Alpha Justice on this specific piece of legislation. Uh, just uh, want to thank Delegate Wells for taking on this uh, piece of legislation. Um, I want to be very clear about what this bill does and is, is designed to do. This is specifically targeting non-convictions, so looking at acquittals, dismissals, and null pros. And the whole point is to just remove it uh, from public view. It's, it's somewhat separate from shielding that I know of uh, with regards to case law. But the whole point of the bill is that, and, and I, I know I read in the fiscal note that this is uh, supposed to delete the three-year uh, waiver. Uh, this was not the intent of the bill. This was simply to take a Acquittals, dismissals, and null pros, store them away from public view so that way employers or any individuals uh, uh, that have a non conviction, uh, it's not used against them in, in you know, regards to different parts of state law. So that's the purpose of the bill to be very clear. Uh, during that three year waiting period, it would be removed to a separate area and only allowed to be used for the purposes of proceedings related to the arrest or charge. Uh, this means something to me specifically because, as an employer, uh, when I was hiring individuals for a training, program, 
myself, I used to run case search on all of my trainees, and unfortunately, I did not uh, fully understand what an acquittal, dismissal, and no process was. So all these charges would pop up, and I would either you know move on to another individual or just assume that this person had a serious uh, problem or that there must be something wrong when an acquittal, dismissal, and no process is technically a not guilty verdict. So I'm kind of, you know, and I see employers do this all the time where they're kind of being, you know, made, uh, uh, treating people as if they're guilty when they were technically uh, not proven as such. So that is the intent of the bill. If you have any questions, uh, I would, I'm here for answers. Ms. Graham, please, for two minutes. Good afternoon. My name is Jeanette Graham. I'm actually very, um, president of No Struggle, No Success. I am in full support of the Senator's Bill 544, House 746. Within the last 19 months, No Struggle, No Success has served 318 individuals. 97 of these individuals were heavily impacted on employment and housing barriers, which was challenges for expungement cases that were, that were considered acquitted, dismissed, stat, non, or non-process. We have attempted to make headway as we do letter recommendations, we educate employers and landlords um, to try to explain to them what was going on with that case or that individual to try to give them a second chance or a fair chance at that employment or that housing opportunity. It's been very hard to remove the stigma of discrimination against their criminal charge or legal uh, barriers. And the fact that it's public view is really hard to try to explain that as with Mr. Deuce just spoke up. These individuals were innocent, but automatically denied, even though we have provided these type of letters and supported them. This has affected us all. This now becomes discouragement to these individuals. Sometimes it leads to reoffending homelessness. And we wanna make sure that individuals who have um, legal and criminal backgrounds and or not, that if this bill is passed, that they're able to gain gainful employment. Um, and, and on behalf of No Struggle Sense, we support this bill. Thank you. Are there questions? And I'm available for any questions. Mr. Mitchell. Okay, and Mr. Mitchell is here. So we'll take Mr. Mitchell now for two minutes, please. Good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity to testify on this, uh, this bill. I support this bill for personal reasons that uh, I, I was released under the Unger decision 10 years ago. I had got a job driving for, for Lyft. They found, they, in, a, in a second record check, they found that I had a charge that was completely dismissed and I couldn't get it ex expunged and I lost I lost employment before because of this. So I support this bill wholeheartedly because I know from personal experience that it's, it's a strong barrier for individuals to, to, to lose employment and also get employment. And some of these things are on there 20, 30, in my particular case, it was 30 years ago, the stuff is still on there. So I'm, I strongly support this bill and hope that you, this, they will see fit to pass it. Thank you. All right. Delegate Bartlett with a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, my first question has been answered, and that was how many um, business owners know what no prosequay means. Um, so you've already answered that one. But my second question is, um, I, you know, I know that one of the problems that the um, state's attorneys or, or law enforcement had with was um, not being able to complete investigations and and no prior history and things of that sort. And you're getting to that. You you take care of that. However, I am looking at the um, the uh, chiefs and sheriffs associations um, opposition. And this sentence is there that I don't understand. And that was um, that HB 726, you know, does prohibit the obliteration of records. Um, and allows for some access. However, the record may only be accessed for purposes of proceedings relating to the arrest or charge. The language does not allow for disclosure for purposes of proceeding relating to the arrest or charge. Do you understand that, those sentences? I'm sorry. I, I feel like yeah. I understood the first sentence and then the second one I was I couldn't quite follow. Because um, I, I think it sounded like they said in, in the testimony that it does allow for access, and then they, the second sentence says that it does not allow for access, is how I heard it just now. Right. From the That's exactly where I read it. I just wanted okay. to make sure. I didn't know if you all had talked and worked that through that or may, something. I'll, we'll work with it. That could be an editing okay. challenge there yeah. in the letter, but we'll um, work with them because this does allow for access, and I, I can verify 
I'm assuming sheriffs, anyone related to the, the case would be allowed to have access. Right, and it says that um, an agency or person defending a suit um, must be allowed to both access and disclose um, disclose the records relating to the incident. So I guess my question is, I thought that that the argument was that you wouldn't be able to have access to records and, and be able to um, handle or go forward with an investigation. So when you have an arrest of someone and you find out that they've been charged with this particular crime more than, you know, previously, mm -hmm. it is helpful for law enforcement to have that information. My question to you is, do you feel that you are adequately addressing that issue for law, um, for law enforcement to be able to access prior um, crimes or prior charges, I should say, prior charges with this particular bill? I guess, Mr. Deuce, if you want yeah, to. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that, that is an interesting set of questions. Because remember, I mean, the, the focus of this bill was on non-convictions, right? So we're talking about acquittals, dismissals, no pros. Uh, the, the way that at least the bill was uh, designed to be drafted was that uh, for the, you know, like it says right there, for the purposes of the arrest or charge, that they would have access to it. I, I guess, and I'm, it's, it's more me than it is you, wonderful, uh, Miss uh, Delegate Bartlett. Uh, I, I'm, if, if they're asking for prior history, that sounds like an entirely separate uh, section. And I, so just to be clear, uh, this was specifically designed so that if individuals did not want to waive their right to sue, that it wouldn't be, that it would be, you know, shifted into storage and kind of placed away. But for the record, if an individual did waive their right to sue on a non-conviction right now, then it would immediately be eligible for expungement. So I, I guess I'm probably not properly understanding what their... Uh, opposition or argument is. Okay. Well, yeah. they'll, they'll, I'm sure they'll come up, and, and perhaps they will, and, and they can explain it. Okay. Um, I just wanted to see if this was addressing a previous argument that we've heard in expungement cases, and that is that the information is not available um, for um, um, when mm -hmm. for law enforcement when they need to know the history with respect to prosecution. Yes. Yeah. So I will say this. Good. This was a negotiation, yes. uh, kind of conversation that I didn't have with the state's attorney's office. So this is probably the one bill that we'll be that's, in favor with. Yes. That's where I was yes. going. I apologize. Yes. Thank yes. you yes. very yes. much. Yes. Yes. All right, we are now trying to juggle multiple things with regard to the bills here just for a moment. Um, we, Before I go to Delegate Phillips, we are going to have to go to Delegate Cardin's bill next. This is House Bill 582. Then we're going to House Bill 44 to Delegate Lopez. We're waiting for our Baltimore City friends for, uh, for the Baltimore City Chair, who is stuck in ways and means where clearly they don't care about your needs or feelings, apparently. I don't know what's going on, but having that, there you go. All right. Um, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to hear Delegate Cardin's bill next, but for now, Delegate Phillips, and then go from there. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Um, this is ingenuous, uh, only because I know frequently what we've heard or what I've heard as a newbie is that in expungements, you need to be able to see the records, and that's why we shouldn't expunge matters. However, I'm looking at the judiciary's response, and that's concerning to me, because what I heard you say is that there is already a provision for taking this data and putting it in a separate file, right? But the judiciary is opposing the bill because they're saying it's unworkable, because in essence, I'm thinking they're saying they don't have this separate database. Can you help me understand what exists today and what would be required to make this work? Now, that is an, in I'm sorry, if you want to. Know. Yeah, that is an interesting provision because in uh, Criminal Procedure 10-101, expungement is defined as one of really two things, either obliteration, which is the total deletion of the record, or expungement via storage. So, I mean, I, there, Similar to how 
shielding would work, I mean, from my understanding, is that it, it would then be shifted to the criminal justice information system, but away from public view. Because from what I was told uh, from members of the state's attorney's office, that there exists two different types. There's, there's, you know, the Maryland case search where everybody can see, and then there's supposed to be this private database. And for the record, I want to be very clear about this. The only reason why I am uh, uh, at least testifying in favor of the kind of uh, removal from public view for this specific bill is because it's a non-conviction, uh, and the individual has the right to just waive the right to sue and then have this expunged immediately. I just, in my conversations with the state's attorney's office, uh, the, the conversations were to say that this one would be uh, something that they could uh, do and implement that this wasn't necessarily. This was a provision of a previous bill last year that we are now bringing back uh, this year that was supposed to necessarily, not necessarily have any opposition. So more conversations probably should be had with the state's attorney's office, and we're willing to have those. If, if they are saying that they're in opposition because they don't have the capacity to do this, when in my conversations they said that this bill wouldn't. You know, well, let me be this. clear. It wasn't the state's attorney's office. Okay, I'll the, apologize. Well, no, no, me. no, no. Yes. It was, it was yes. the judiciary, okay. right? Yes. And so at some point I think we need to figure out with the judiciary – where the disconnect is. You got it. If you could work on that. Yeah, there was a, um, a, I believe it was the chair of the Judiciary Committee last year who said no bill comes into his committee perfect. And I will take uh, some privilege with that and honor the statement that no bill comes into his committee perfect and work with Judiciary to make sure that we do hammer this one out. Thank you. Thank you. Delegate Tomlinson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm looking at the uh, – not the same document that um, Delia Phelps was talking about, but I'm looking at uh, the Chief of Police and Sheriff's Association, and I don't, I don't believe they're coming up to talk about it. So, um, And it's not, not that it's your job to defend what they're saying, <laughs> or why would you want to? But um, no, there's one paragraph that I'm, I'm kind of confused about, and maybe you can – help clarify or bring some light to what they're talking about. Um, do you have it in front of you there? Yeah, the bill, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so the bill, I have the bill in front of me. Oh, not, I'm sorry. Not, okay. not, I didn't yeah, know I don't have access to that level of yeah. So, So they write that uh, this House bill does prohibit the obliteration of records before three years and allows for some level of access. However, the record may only be assessed or assessed – accessible for purposes of proceedings related to the arrest or charge. The language does not allow for disclosures for purposes of proceedings related to the arrest or charge. An agency or person defending a suit must be allowed to both access and disclose the records relating to the incident. Yeah, so um, that was a similar question that was raised by Delegate Bartlett. Um, I think there could be a – I think there's a, a – maybe a – we can clarify, but I think it's a typo because okay. the language does acknowledge that there is that it is access, made accessible. So I'm hoping that maybe they thought it wasn't accessible, and they read the bill again. They're like, "Oh, it does allow for this," and they forgot to remove that sentence. Is what I'm. But we have to clarify okay. that with them. Yeah. You're confused. We're a little. We're all a little confused by this. <laughs> Not gonna lie. So. Yes. Sorry. Thank you for putting Sorry. on the record that we're all confused. <laughs> do, you, do, do you have any more? Okay. All <laughs> uh, right, seeing no further questions, we thank you very much. Thank and that you. concludes the testimony for 746. Now we're going to Delegate Cardin out of order to House Bill 582. He has five witnesses. Um, They're all favorable. Um, we'll hear from Michael Shire, Michael Davey, Frank Boston, Ari Plout. Ari's not coming, I'm here. Okay. Cool. Yep. Delegate Cardin for three minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the Judiciary Committee. For the record, John Cardin here on behalf of House Bill 582 asking for your favorable uh, report on it. Uh, this bill uh, simply is a clarification bill to try and make sure that we have predictability and understanding in how uh, police officers are um, investigated and how investigations um, may be terminated or ended. Um, I did provide staff with two amendments, which seem to uh, – everybody seems to – there seems to be peace in the valley on both of these amendments. Um, and the first one basically uh, clarifies that it should be – the statute of limitations for a termination of an investigation should be a year and a day 
from the time that the um, agency knew about the investigation. Mr. Davies, I'm sure, is going to clarify all that. Basically, this just creates a statute of limitations so that um, officers won't remain under investigation uh, indefinitely. But as, as it was the intent of the original bill is that there is um, investigations and they're done in a way that is both predictable and understandable by all parties. That's it. Thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Michael Davey. I'm general counsel to the Maryland State Fraternal Order of Police, and we, we are requesting a favorable report on House Bill 582. Uh, as the delegates stated, this is basically cleanup language to the Police Accountability Act uh, that was created in 2021. Then House Bill 670, the idea was to require transparency, citizens' involvement, and efficiency in the manner in which these internal investigations are done. Uh, a major concern of both the General Assembly and the citizens were these investigations were taking too long. They weren't getting notified, and these cases just never ended. They continued to linger. Under Section 3113 of the Police Accountability Act, there is a statute of limitations for those cases or investigations that were or complaints made by the public. Section 3113C states that the process of review of the investigative unit through disposition by the administrative charging <coughs> committee shall be completed uh, within one year and one day after the filing of the complaint by the citizen. So that takes care of the statute of limitations for any complaint by the public that goes to the administrative charging committee. But the law is silent as it pertains to those internal investigations that don't go to the administrative charging committee, that are just held internally because they were not made by the public there is no statute of limitations in the law right now, and we're asking for that statute of limitation to be in. We met with the Maryland Chiefs of Police and the Sheriff's Association. We came up with the amendments that the delegate talked about. One year and one date from the date the incident comes to the attention of the appropriate official from the police department, and we agreed to an exception to that one year and one day, and those were for <coughs> officers who are being investigated for criminal activity, because we understand that that can take longer than a year and a day. Discipline is not, should not always be initiated to punish an officer. It's basically used to create, create or excuse me, correct uh, inappropriate behavior. Having an internal investigation linger two, three, four years doesn't do that. At that point, the officer is no longer motivated. We just want these cases to be done, be done in a timely manner so the complainants can find out the results. Thank you. Okay. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I'm Frank Boston. And I'm here as the legislative attorney for the State Fraternal Order of Police. We thank uh, Delegate Cardin for putting this bill in. This is my first time testifying this year, believe it or not, before this committee. <laughs> and I am happy to say that because I have two fine FOP lawyers, not fine like that, you know what I mean. <laughs> I'll, take, I'll take that compliment. <laughs> but I have two... <laughs> well, with that, I'm going to stop while I'm here and say, me too. <laughs> they will deliver the testimony. All right. Good afternoon. I'm uh, yeah, Michael Shire. I'm one of those right. fine lawyers for the FOP. Uh, I'm also a, a police officer with 19 years of experience here in the state. Uh, speaking here today, uh, representing the FOP, thank you to Delegate Card for putting in this uh, important <laughs> legislation. Um, this, it, this is just a statute of limitations for internal administrative charges. Uh, it's important to note that there is already one, as Mr. Davies said, for complaints that are involving members of the public. So what falls into these types of complaints that are not involving members of the public? You're talking about things that could be very simple, like a police officer not shining their shoes, being late for duty, or maybe backing a police car into a pole behind the station. As it currently stands, a police officer could be, say, late for work, as we said, and then 20 years later, their supervisor, who noted the officer's tardiness, is now in a position of greater power, and they want to administratively charge the officer. Without a statute of limitations, as this proposes, these minor offenses hang over the officer's head indefinitely. That's obviously terrible for morale and poses a huge opportunity for, uh, for abuse by the, the agencies. Um, as Mr. Davey also says, we want these things disposed of in a timely manner. It's to everybody's benefit to do so. Statute of limitations do have important due process implications. They are common in our legal system. Requiring them ensures that accused parties can adequately prepare their defense, gather evidence against them, 
ensure that all that is preserved and available. Uh, as I mentioned, it prevents abuses which could be used to improperly influence the behavior of an accused officer under threat of such an untimely prosecution. Uh, we do have no issue with the amendments that have been proposed, making the, the start time trigger the point where the violation came to the agency's attention. That's certainly more than enough time to conduct the investigation, place the charges, and we are also okay with the statute of limitations not applying to criminal charges, as Mr. Davies said. We, uh, we find lawyers thank you for your time and ask that you report favorably on HB 582. Thank you. Mr. Chair, the uh, Chiefs and Sheriffs did put in testimony, I believe, saying they would be favorable with those two amendments that we did put in. Um, and I'll be happy to go talk to the state police as well at this point. Questions for the panel? Oh, and the state police has already indicated that they'll be okay with the amendments as proposed. Okay. Just FYI. We're going to go to Delegate Williams and Delegate Park. Um, thank you, Delegate Cardin, for bringing this bill and the amendments, I think, which address, like you said in your testimony, the concerns raised by the police and sheriffs and the um, Maryland State Police and others. Um, I know with the amendments you had mentioned uh, the exception of the one year one day as it related to criminal charges. And I was just hoping either you or someone else on your panel, if you could elaborate on the necessity for that exception. Why is that a necessity for us to have an exception for criminal charges as opposed to other matters? Sure, I, I can answer that. Thank you. Um, the these cases just take longer because it's basically two investigations occurring. You have the criminal investigation. Uh, they're investigating the officer for his criminal acts. Because of the Garrity provision where officers, if they're compelled to give statements, they can't be used against them in the criminal case, any statement given by that officer, if it's uh, not compelled, can't be used against them criminally. So the administrative case usually takes a step back because they want to know what the officer says, and they want to wait for the criminal case to be adjudicated before they will take a court or an order or a compelled statement from the officer. It, it can get a little confusing. Um, I'm actually in the middle of a trial right now similar to this. Departments have taken the position that they shouldn't do anything while the criminal case is going on, and that's really not what they should be doing. Okay. What they should be doing is running a concurrent investigation, and the only thing that should be left would be the order to compel the officer to give a statement. But a lot of times, most of the time, they do, don't do that. The administrative end just sits back, lets the criminal side work, and then they try to start it over again uh, once that's over. Not probably the most efficient way to do it, but I'm a defense attorney and not an attorney for the police department. I'll, I'll just add one other thing. The standard of proof on a criminal case is obviously higher. Right. If you get a conviction on the criminal case, then the administrative case kind of is easy after that It's because it has that lower standard of proof. So in, in some regards, uh, it, it may make sense to get that criminal conviction first, then the administrative case is a, a <coughs> foreground conclusion. And given the scenario that you had mentioned, what would be kind of the time frame then if there's a criminal case pending, if the um, – administration is doing either a concurrent investigation or if you like you said some um, are not doing the concurrent investigation and waiting till the criminal case has come to its conclusion what type of time frame are we looking well, at then? I'll just give you one example of a case that I handled dealing with a police officer and we managed to have it delayed for for as a strategy on the defense side for well over a year I'm in the middle of a case right now from a criminal case the incident occurred in 2020, and we're just doing the administrative trial board as we speak. So three years later. Yeah. Okay. And it's already in the statute for cases to go to the ACC already. Right. Okay. So it's just making it analogous to that. Got it. Okay. That's all my questions. Thank you. Further questions for this panel? Seeing none, thank you all very much. Thank that you. concludes the testimony on House Bill 582. We're now going back to the order we were going in. This is House Bill 44 and Delegate Lopez. Um, if I could ask for Delegate Lopez, Larry Polsky, Vanita Taylor, Kim Haven, Jason Billingsley, Deborah Buck. Oh, I'm sorry, that's uh, in opposition. So we'll we'll just hear from those first ones. Larry Polsky, Vanita Taylor, Kim Haven, and Jason Billingsley. Is Mr. Billingsley here? He wasn't here on a previous bill. I don't see him. Okay, that's fine. We'll start here and go from there. Sure. Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, members of Judiciary Committee. For the record, I'm Delegate Leslie Lopez here to ask for a favorable support for HB 44, which protects pregnant inmates by requiring our state correctional institutions provide them with substance use disorder screening while they are incarcerated and requires them to establish procedures for continuity of care after they are released from state custody. Like many of you, I was absolutely horrified to hear the story of Jasmine Valentine, who was forced to give birth in solitary confinement at the Washington County Detention Center while guards laughed at her cries for help because they presumed she was suffering from substance use disorder. It took over an hour for Jasmine to give birth, um, to give birth uh, and uh, for, to be transported to the hospital. Because of this, her baby, who weighed only four pounds, eight ounces, caught a staph infection due to the unsanitary conditions in the jail. Thankfully, both Jasmine and her daughter are doing well today. However, no incarcerated person should ever have to suffer through a situation like this. Here's what this bill does specifically. HB 44 requires that all pregnant inmates be screened for substance use disorder upon intake. If the inmate tests positive, the facility must refer the inmate to the behavioral health to a behavioral health provider for assessment, counseling on all treatment options, and continuation of medication when applicable. If the inmate was not on medication uh, treatment regimen for um, substance use disorder before incarceration, they must be started on that medication if it is recommended. This bill further provides continuing care after the person is released from state custody, uh, and that requires correctional units to work with government agencies to ensure that the individual has health insurance coverage, refer the individual to a qualified reproductive health care provider, and also to a community-based mental health and substance use professional. Uh, in 2020, the Maternal Mortality Review Report found that unintentional drug overdose was the leading cause of death for pregnant women for the sixth year in a row. Timely, appropriate, proven interventions can help reduce this mortality rate by putting individuals on the path to recovery as early as possible, allowing them to have the healthiest pregnancies and deliveries that they can. Making sure that all pregnant individuals in state custody have access to quality care providers that work to combat substance use disorder issues, both while they're incarcerated and after, will help protect the health and future not only of women in Maryland's correctional facilities, but also the children they have. Thank you, and I ask for a favorable support. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Larry Polsky. I'm here on behalf of the Maryland Association of County Health Officers in strong support of HB 44. I'm also a board-certified obstetrician with extensive experience treating substance use disorders. I chose to specialize in OB because pregnancy motivates people to improve their health like no other time in their lives. A decade ago, when I shifted my career from a practicing obstetrician to lead a local health department, the first new program I created was a multidisciplinary effort to provide care for pregnant and postpartum women dealing with substance, substance misuse. This included a partnership with our local detention center. Over and over during the last nine years, we've seen pregnant women who have struggled their entire adult lives with drug dependence finally able to maintain sobriety with professional support. Postpartum, most of these women have continued with treatment, proven to be good parents, and with ongoing support have gone on to find employment or complete their education. The individuals impacted by this bill represent a medically high-risk population. When given the opportunity for proper treatment, we can see dramatic results. HB 44 will ensure that any pregnant woman with drug dependence who enters a correctional facility will have the opportunity to initiate timely and appropriate care in keeping with the recommendations of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. The reality is that if medical care isn't provided soon after the individual is incarcerated, both baby and mother's health are at increased risk. This bill will also help to accomplish two major statewide goals. It will ensure entry into care for those in rural areas where access to community care is limited, and HB 44 will play a role in decreasing disparities in maternal mortality, particularly among African American women. HB 44 and its cross file have drawn bipartisan sponsorship because it, it closes important health care gaps regardless of the jurisdiction or political party that you represent. On behalf of the state's health officers, I ask for your support and welcome any questions. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Kimberly Haven. I'm here again today on behalf of um, Reproductive Justice Inside. This bill is quite honestly a very simple bill. 
It is about codifying best practices. At the end of the day, that's really all it is. It is not controversial. It is about ensuring good maternal health outcomes. It is about giving a pregnant individual agency over her body to seek the appropriate care and substance use treatment that she needs. While people are in our care, custody, and control, we have the opportunity, and I hate the word control, it's really supposed to be care, custody, and management, let's be honest, to give them the help that they need, the tools that they need to set them up for those good maternal health outcomes. Honestly, at the end of the day, I couldn't come before this body with a simpler body, with a simpler bill. Sorry, it's, I put one cup of coffee today. Um, this is simply about codifying best practices. It is about giving and arming an individual to seek the care that, that she needs, that she wants, and when she goes home back to her community, to be referred to a provider in her community that is going to continue that level of care. At the end of the day, that's all we really want. We want good maternal health outcomes, and this is one strong measure to ensure that. And again, best practices, codification. For that, I urge a favorable report on HB 44, and thank you. Good afternoon, Vanita Taylor from the Public Defender's Office. We request and strongly request that you support this bill and give it a favorable outcome. What we will say is two things. Release without treatment equals relapse. Incarceration without treatment equals relapse. If we in Maryland want healthy babies, healthy women, healthy families, then we must provide the required treatment that our citizens require and deserve. When we think about people who are um, abusing alcohol without treatment, we call them dry drunks. And everyone understands what that means. That means someone is just not drinking, but that does not mean that they've dealt with the issues that led to them being um, an alcoholic. The same goes for someone who has a substance abuse disorder. That if you are just clean because you're incarcerated, that does not deal with the issues that led to your substance abuse. You must deal with the issues that led to the substance abuse or you will have relapse. It is proven, it is stated, it is known. We want clean citizens, we want healthy women, we want healthy babies, but we also want um, everyone to acknowledge that women are different than men, which is why um, there was the equity bill one year, then there was the pre-release center the next year, then it was the funding for the pre-release center the third year. This bill is about programming. Programming so that we can have equity across the spectrum regarding women who have who suffer from a disease, which is a substance abuse disorder, receiving the proper medical treatment that they require. Delegate Kaufman, now for questions. Very briefly, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, Delegate Lopez, it may come as no surprise to you that the Department of Corrections is opposed to your bill. And... Uh, they say essentially that we're already doing this and it would be a hassle, the bill would be a hassle for us. So they say we already do the substance use treatment and you know, we're already doing what Delegate Lopez wants essentially and we do a great job at it. So do you, other than that one harrowing anecdote that you gave, um, do you have other examples or could you go into a little bit of your rationale about how maybe you disagree with them and how maybe they're sure. not doing as well as they say? Sure. So just briefly, from my understanding, they're not opposing. They just wrote a letter of information where they're explaining what their um, policies and procedures are. I think... Thank um, you. It sounded like a letter of opposition. Sure. So yeah. No, it's... Um, um, of course, I would welcome the support, right? Um, but I'll take a letter of information in, in the meantime. I think it's, you know, good to clarify things. Um, I think that if their only opposition or only area of content is we're already doing this, we might as well codify it and, and bring it up to the standards that it needs to be. But I would, I'll defer to um, members of the, the sponsor panel to give individual stories that I think would be of interest to you. Thank you, Delegate. Good bill. So uh, keep, please, uh, committee, keep in mind that this is not only for state prison, but applies to local jails as well. And before we had our program at our local health department in Calvert, uh, women were not referred. We now have a very easy process, which should be replicable everywhere across the state. The, um, the health staff in the detention center knows us when they identify that an incarcerated woman is pregnant. 
the nurse picks up the phone, she knows exactly who to talk to, it's one phone call, and then we do all the work. So I think um, there was some, um, in, in the Department of Public Safety Corrections letter, there might have been some um, misperceptions there. They do not register people for health insurance. That is our job. We have staff who do that. They just need to notify us that that woman is incarcerated. We do the work. So most of the actual burden is actually on local health departments and our partners. It's not actually on Department of Public Safety and Corrections. And if I could add to that very briefly, um, we know that the department says that they're doing this, and to Delegate Lopez's point, let's just codify it, but we also know that it's hit or miss. I've been in Western Maryland, I've been on the Eastern Shore, and every institution does something a little bit differently. It also depends on you know, what their prevailing ideology is. This way, if it's codified, we can at least ensure that we're moving in the right direction. And this really is best practices, and it should apply universally across the board and not subject to whoever's leading a facility. And I would tell you that whether it is happening in the local prison, we do know that in Jessup, of the women's facility, it occurs depending upon who is the warden. And we have had several clients. I am also involved with the Family um, Recovery Program, a transitional housing program, and substance abuse drug court in Baltimore City. And we have been told by our residents that those who receive MAT treatment before they enter the facility, that there is oftentimes a lapse before they receive their medication. Um, so this bill is needed to codify to make sure that it doesn't depend upon who is the warden, that this is a matter of Maryland law, that it will be done, no matter who is sitting in the big chair. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further questions for the panel? Delegate Valentine. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you all for coming in today. I do have a question on page three of the bill. It would be down in line, we start in line 15 and work our way down for subsections one, two, and three. Two and three refer to referring individual for care or referring folks, but number one says contact and work with the appropriate government agency. How much is incumbent upon the facility and how involved will that be other than like two and three is you're making referrals. Mm -hmm. How in depth is number one, the point number one? So in our county, it is one phone call that Misty, who's the head nurse over in our jail, she knows me, she has my cell number, she has my nurse who heads our program's cell number, she just needs to make a call. We take care of everything else. We contact Department of Social Services, we help out with insurance. All of the substance use care that's going to happen out in the community as, as, as um, people transition back out. And we need to keep in mind with justice reinvestment that there are lots of good. I worked with Delegate Barron on that bill a few years back. But one of the challenges of that is that when you have a pregnant woman who comes in, instead of being in, incarcerated for three months, she's only there for three days, you have a very limited window to be able to link her to services. Mm -hmm. And as was mentioned otherwise, if you miss that window, you're back into the same cycle. So it is very possible, because we've been doing it successfully for nine years in our county, to have a one phone call or one email, however you want to do it in your county, referral system, and that's the entire burden on the, um, on, on the detention center. And I understand that completely. Mine was just the wording because I, that could be interpreted 24 different ways in 24 jur jur different jurisdictions. The work with terminology, that was my only question. You explained it perfectly. It's more like a referral, like yeah. points two and three. Correct. A referral. Thank you. Seeing no other questions, we thank you all very much. And that concludes the testimony for House. Oh, no, it doesn't. We have one person in opposition. I'm sorry. Uh, so we're going to hear from one person in opposition. Deborah Bercato, please. For two minutes once she gets settled down. Good afternoon, Chairman and uh, members of the committee. My name is Deborah Bercato, and I'm from Maryland Right to Life. And we would like to commend Delegate Lopez for her humanitarian concern for pregnant women who are incarcerated and suffering from drug addiction. If the intention of the bill is only for that purpose to, to help her with her drug addiction, then we definitely support that. What we are concerned with is any funding that would be for abortion or abortion services. Drug addiction falls under mental health care, so, and mental health care is a reason uh, used to provide coverage for abortion. 
The women in prison who are pregnant are at the mercy of the prison system for where they seek their maternity care. If abortion is prior prioritized, they will be sent to centers that provide and promote abortion services. We feel that these ladies should not be discriminated against or should never be coerced to abort their babies simply because they are in prison and suffering from a drug addiction. We would like to make sure that they could see an actual doctor so that if they are choosing to have their babies, that they will be supported in their maternity care as well as being treated for their drug addiction. We know that with the Abortion Care Access Act that was passed last year, that that the physician requirement is no longer required for abortion. So if these women in prison are sent to centers that are uh, prioritize abortion, then they might not even be seen by a physician. What we really urge this committee and the members here is to add an amendment that would exclude any type of abortion funding for being used in this bill. So we do care about the women in prison, but we want them to see the, receive the best care possible, and that would be an obstetrician who can treat their uh, them and their unborn baby, but also treat them for their drug addiction. So we urge you to add an amendment. Without the amendment, we do oppose House Bill 44. Thank you. Yes, um, thank you so much um, for uh, coming and testifying. I guess I, I'm a little confused because I read the bill, mm -hmm. um, but I didn't see any mention of abortion in the bill or reference to abortion. So I, if you can just let me know where. There's no direct mention for abortion, but certainly when you talk about referrals, and when we know that abortion is used to treat, um, you know, women come and, and, and get abortion and abortion coverage for mental health reasons such as depression and or anxiety. And the woman could certainly, while she, if she's seeing a person for her maternity care and be coerced into saying, well, you're in prison and you're, you have drug addiction, maybe it would be better for your drug addiction to not be pregnant at this time. But if this woman is wanting to have her baby, she should receive care that supports her decision to have her baby while also getting drug addiction. You can receive a positive birth outcome with getting uh, treatment for drug addiction. I, as a matter of fact, I have a friend whose two grandchildren were adopted um, and the mother was a drug addicted person. Those two children are reaching all their milestones. So while the drug addicted mother did not choose to keep her children, she did choose to put them up for adoption so they could be cared for as they were growing up. Okay, I mean, I agree with the comment that you can't have positive birth outcomes with proper um, addiction treatment um, while pregnant, but I just don't, I, I've never heard the correlation about mental health and abortion. So, but thank you so much. I appreciate you coming before us. Seeing none. Thank you very much. Right, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Now that concludes uh, the hearing on House Bill 44. Now we'll go to the Baltimore City Bills with uh, uh, the chair of the Baltimore City delegation, Delegate Smith. House Bill 632. Um, is it just you, Sheriff, or do you have anybody else? I think it's just, just me. Joseph Whitaker, Lenora Dawson, Ke Kevin Hayes. I I'm going to handle it. He's You're going to handle it? Yeah, gonna Sounds it. good. <laughs> All right. Uh, 632. 632. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. For the record, I'm Delegate Stephanie Smith here to present House Bill 632. And I, I want to say hello to my colleagues, distinguished colleagues on the committee. It's my first time in judiciary this session. And so I'm excited um, to not only present this bill, but to present to some our newest sheriff and the city of Baltimore, Sheriff Kogan. And so this um, is a bill that simply will um, expand our sheriff's capability to um, have the staff that he needs to execute his really grand vision for professionalizing, as well as providing more holistic services from his office. So I don't want to steal too much of his thunder because he's the expert here. But the most important thing is um, this bill would really um, remove kind of the administrative burden of always having to come back every time he needs to make certain hiring decisions. So this is um, a flexibility that I hope you do carefully consider extending um, through House Bill 632, and we definitely hope to receive a favorable report, but I would like to give him an opportunity to expand on that. Thank you so much. Thank you. So uh, thank you to the sponsor. I appreciate you all, uh, and I appreciate this committee, and thank you to the chair. Um, so uh, just getting into this bill, uh, what we normally would have to do as a sheriff's office if we wanted to increase our personnel or take on additional duties would come before you 
and say we need an extra three deputies or four deputies, and we put that in the state language. And what this bill does is it sort of unlocks that, and it ties it to Baltimore City funding. So if the mayor wants us to take over a service, they can fund that service in our general budget, and we can increase our personnel. And that's much more efficient. We're looking to expand uh, our role in public safety in Baltimore City, and that's very helpful. The other thing that this bill does that I'm super excited about is it allows us to uh, hire social workers, and we want to utilize those social workers in our eviction section so we can connect people with services before they're evicted um, and after they're evicted. Uh, and we want them to work at the sheriff's office. So, uh, for example, we hear all the time that someone didn't know how to fill out the form because they couldn't read to get rental assistance. Um, and if that gets referred to us, we want to utilize our social workers to prevent an eviction that could be prevented. And then when our deputies are out and they actually have to evict somebody, we want to change the pattern of the deputy goes in, tells someone they have 15 minutes to leave, and then go down the street and offers no services. That's what happens in most places. What we want to do is we want to say to them, do you have a place to go? Are you suffering? from drug addiction, how can we help you, how can we connect you with services right here in the field, and then our deputies will make a call to our social workers who will try to connect them with services. The other thing it will do is we'll collect data that's not being collected before. So we don't know how many people were evicted for under $100, for under $200, what's happening to people after they're being evicted. And, and implementing social workers, it will have a data collection component that I think is incredibly important for people like yourselves who are looking to make good policy to have the information to make that policy. Um, the other thing this bill does, it, it adds two assistant sheriffs. Uh, that's for greater supervision and to impl implement the police accountability uh, things that, that we have to implement within the office. And so for all those reasons, I'd ask for your favorable report, and I can take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Sheriff Kogan, for coming in. It's always great to see you. Thank you. Um, so right now, if you, if you want to have two additional sheriffs, you've got to come here, ask us, then you got to go to Baltimore City and get it funded. That's correct. And they have to, they have to, so you have to basically get a letter from Baltimore City saying, we're going to provide the money, you have to provide the permission. Correct. So you're just getting rid of the permission. As long as they have the money, you want to be able to do what they're doing. So what happens if they say, oh, we don't have enough money to maintain these sheriffs in two years? Well, sure. It, so there's no fiscal note in this bill because it says the sheriff may point up, a point up to a maximum. So it's already a may, it's not a shall. Um, so they could do that already. Um, but what it does is it says, since it gets rid of that maximum, and it says if we want you to take over a service, like for example, we took over the domestic violence protective order service from the police department, and we had to come to the General Assembly, and we, before we could implement that, and we'd have to ask for additional staff, and that really delayed something. Um, and, and it's not really necessary. No other sheriff's office I know has to do that. Um, and so what, what we're asking for is to say that if the mayor wants to fund it or a grant wants to fund it, um, then we can implement those positions as long as they're paid for, and we don't have to come back and, and really get it legislated through the state legislative process. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a quick question. Uh, do any other sheriff's office have these types of limitations across the state? No, know? no. they used to. If you look, if you sort of go through the courts and judicial proceedings uh, under where sheriffs have, it, they, they all used to have this. It said they could have 23 deputies, and then they all amended it to say uh, it's based on the funding. Usually it's based on, like, the local government and budgetary funding. I'm just looking at the rest of the statute that's listed here, and I just I see these other – mandates, limitations, well, I wouldn't call them limitations, but like if you wanted another deputy sheriff major, you would have to come back here. Is that correct? That's, well, uh, under this bill, I, I wouldn't have to do that, but without this bill, I would have to do that. No, no, it says the sheriff shall appoint, so it's two sections. There's a section you're referring right. to that takes out the max, but then before that is right. the section that you have a specific number, and that's where you're getting the extra two assistant sheriffs. I just question, and maybe another conversation for another day, but whether we should even have these limitations on you. But thank you for your thank, thank you for your question. I appreciate that. Any more questions? Um, all right. Uh, Delegate Valentine. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Sheriff, for coming in. Um, I just want to clarify, I think it does say that in, in this where – in the bill, it will give you flexibility at the rank of sergeant and below. Right. Is that where, 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 how I'm reading it correctly? I, I believe so, yes. And, and I believe in the fiscal impact where it says that there really will be no um, 
their fiscal impact. Is this kind of like you can do like a restructuring within the personnel you have, therefore you're not going to have a fiscal impact because you can reallocate, promote, kind of move around, and that's why there's no fiscal impact? That's correct. And, and or, or the fiscal impact is that the mayor can decide through the budgetary process to increase it. Right. Um, and so there would be no fiscal impact there. And the assistant sheriffs we're adding, we, all, we have them already. The city's already, we are, there are special assistant sheriffs, and that's just codifying this. So everything's paid for already. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Sheriff, I just want to say thank you for being here. I, I've been on the opposite side of this a number of times, all right? I've, I've been a landlord in Baltimore City on a few different rentals, and I've, I've been on an eviction before. And, and it's a nerve-wracking experience and for me and for the, for the tenant as well. Your data collection, your proactive approach, you know, proper staffing, I support that, you know, wholeheartedly. Thank you. you. Know, when, when you have one or two rentals in the city, you don't understand the process either. And so when you can work with the sheriff's department so everyone can be educated, that's important. So thank you for your service. I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. You're welcome. Isn't that so? All right. <laughs> Seeing no further questions, all right, we got you out of here reasonably. Thank you. I appreciate right. it. Thank you very much, Mr. Sheriff. Thank you very much. That concludes the testimony on House Bill 632. Now, House Bill 613, which I believe includes Liam Davis, constituent of the 46th District, who committee is mildly admonished not to traumatize during this hearing. The House Bill uh, 613, Liam Davis, Nina Themelis, I'll get it right someday, James Turner, and Tavon Braxton from the Baltimore City Department of Transportation. Go ahead. Delegate Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And for the record, Delegate Stephanie Smith here to present House Bill 613. This is um, a local bill that is presented at the request of the Mayor Scott administration. And this bill is um, focused on ensuring that our special enforcement officers um, are provided the same level of protection under the law when they are unfortunately assaulted while performing official duties. You will hear testimony today from the Baltimore City Department of Transportation in reference to incidents where um, you know, on record, there have been different um, concerns expressed by the Traffic Enforcement Division. Um, this legislation um, basically adds special enforcement officers, special parking enforcement officers, and special traffic enforcement officers to the list of first responders who currently receive greater protection under the law when, when assaulted in the commission of their duties. So um, I know there will be further details provided by my panel, but I do um, hope that I can receive careful consideration and hopefully a favorable report for House Bill 613. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Delegate Smith, for introducing this critical piece of the legislation. And thank you, Chair Klippinger and Vice Chair Moon, for allowing us to speak here today about this important bill, House Bill 613. So just to keep it very simple, House Bill 613 seeks to expand assault protections to Baltimore City traffic enforcement officers that already exist for police officers, parole officers, firefighters, first responders, and medics. Um, for those of you who are unaware, what is a TEO? A TEO is one of our traffic enforcement officers. They're critical for helping um, enforce parking regulations, whether it be residential permit parking, street sweeping, peak hour parking. Um, they help keep the corridors clear and free flowing of traffic during special events. So they do serve a critical purpose um, for the citizens and businesses of Baltimore. Um, one thing of note that is worth mentioning is our TEOs are, are unarmed, and that makes it a pretty precarious situation when they are being assaulted. Um, and in terms of the demographic breakdown of our TEOs, the, every single member who self-reported, self-reported as African American, and the vast majority of our TEOs are also women. So we were talking about African American women who are often feeling the brunt of these assaults that are occurring. Um, we do want to mention that this legislation has the full support of our staff, um, and you will be hearing from our Deputy Director, Tavon Braxton, who will be providing more information. With that being said, speaking on behalf of Baltimore City Administration, we respectfully request a favorable report on House Bill 613. Thank you. Good, af Good afternoon, Chair Clippature and uh, other members of the committee. My name is Tavon Braxton. I am the Deputy Director of Operations for Baltimore City's Department of Transportation. Um, within my portfolio of oversight includes the safety division wherein lies the brave men and women that have prompted House Bill 613 for your consideration. 
In my hand, I hold an abridged, not unabridged, abridged summary of documented assaults to our enforcement officers that include incidents that are described, accounts of males striking officers several times in the face after getting a ticket, mm -hmm. uh, being spat on by a citizen, being struck by an unknown object in the face by a citizen, two males pull a gun on an officer, just to name a few. Note that many of the officers were women, well, are women, um, and the outcome is often no prosecution or arrest, yet in some cases the officers are hospitalized. Um, if you recall in my earlier statement, I mentioned a summary of documented assaults. Undocumented accounts are not to be forgotten either. The irony is that many of our officers have formed a soldier-like resilience born out of necessity due to the challenges in the field. Their first inclination is to defend rather than report, but as a result, many incidents are unreported. Now, by and large, you know, our officers enjoy the work that they do. You know, many have made a career as a traffic enforcement officers. Others have left due to the hazards. And with the fluctuating hiring and attrition, the looming dangers of the job exacerbate the challenges of staffing this workforce. Now, what we can say is with certainty is that the demand for parking and directional traffic enforcement will remain high. This bill would lend our officers the peace of mind of knowing that TEOs garner the same respect as first responders so that would-be offenders will think twice before assaulting an officer, knowing that felony assault is subject to imprisonment in up to 10 years or a fine of up to 5000 or both, even if it's for a $52 ticket. So, in conclusion, the, the public will only grant the level of respect that leadership affords its representatives. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Clippinger and members of the committee. My name is James Turner, and I work alongside Liam Davis in the BCDOT Government Affairs and Policy Office. I'm happy to be here today on AKA Day and show my support by wearing pink. And although not a part of any sorority or fraternity, <laughs> both of my hey, both of my both of my parents are proud HBC unit uh, students. War proud HBCU students at Agnes Scott and Morehouse University, okay. and I loved any opportunity to so much show my support on for the bill. Black sororities. On the bill, on the bill. <laughs> Thank you. I won't belabor. I won't belabor Mr. Davis's or Mr. Braxton's point for the sake of time. Here's what I will say: At its core, HB 613 is simply about safety, the safety we all want when we go into work, knowing that if anything negative happens to us. If we are harassed, harmed, or threatened, that there will be negative consequences for those people who committed these actions. Our TEOs go into work every day, unarmed, knowing that they may have to go through these negative things, like Mr. Braxton, Braxton mentioned, and that those perpetrators may not be held accountable in a meaningful way for these actions. HB 613 holds these actors and their actions accountable. And that is why I and those TEOs watching and those patrolling our streets at this very moment support a favorable report on HB 613 from the committee. Thank you for your time. Are there questions for the panel? Delegate Boucher. Thank you, Chair. Excuse my ignorance if I didn't catch it, but are these special enforcement officers armed with any defensive weapons such as mace or a taser? No. No, they are not. Would, would you all be supportive of these officers being armed with such defensive weapons and being trained to help defend them? Not particularly. Um, I think there are implications to it. Uh, the, we, we don't want to... We don't want to exacerbate the, the issue. We don't want them to be placed in positions to defend themselves. We just want precautionary measures to avoid these confrontations. May I add, um, just um, in terms of those um, first responders that are currently protected under statute, they do include medics who also normally do not carry those types of defensive weapons. So I just, weapons. So I just want to note that we're asking for them to be included in um, a subgroup of um, workers who do not all have the same, you know, weapon access or training. So that, you know, just want to put that out there. Well, I just seem to be concerned about female officers being victimized at a severe physical disadvantage. If we could potentially train them how to defend themselves of any defensive mechanisms, 
would add to what you're trying to truly accomplish here. And I'd be willing to hear maybe some amendments or something to help them in that, that avenue instead of just the enforcement because this is after the fact. I'm trying to look at what's happening right then and there when a female officer is being assaulted. What avenues does she have to defend her health from those assaults? That's a big concern for all of us. Thank you. <clears throat> Delegate Valentine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have a question um, in, in regards to EMTs and firefighters and, and rescue squad personnel. Um, they're typically in a group. Do your um, enforcement officers typically work alone or do they work in tandem like together or how does that work? By and large, they work alone. There are times where they work in uh, groups of two or three just when they're doing uh, more triage mm -hmm. of, of locations. But for the most part, they work alone. And my last question, do they at least have some type of radio communication where they can converse or, or if they did need assistance, they have that ability? They do have radio use. Thank you. All right, I have some questions. Um, have you considered issuing body cameras to traffic enforcement officers? Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Based, based on your feedback at the recent um, City House delegation meeting, we did crunch numbers. Um, talking with our friends at Baltimore City Police Department. Um, and this is preliminary. It would really need to be crunched down a little bit more, uh, further detail with finance department. But that would add on a uh, annual cost we expect of over $270,000 um, per year. So that would be a conversation that we would have to have with City Finance Department to see if there are any dollars available to, to manage such a program. And, and, Stand it up. All right. Let me go to uh, direct another question. You had you held up a binder with complaints. How many of those were were turned into criminal complaints? How many of those were filed in district court as uh, as assaults? With without knowing for sure, I would say at least twenty percent. So of how many? Uh, you don't know how many complaints know. there are. It's, it's plenty in there. Okay. Is the issue here that it's a felony or a misdemeanor because of the penalty, or is it, I mean, the penalty wouldn't change between an assault. An assault is 10 years. This bill would keep it at 10 years. It would just make it a felony as opposed to a misdemeanor. What is the issue more that police officers aren't able to make an arrest unless they see the assault when it's a misdemeanor as opposed to a felony? Is that the issue that we're dealing with here, or, or what's the issue? I believe that that is the issue, okay. Delegate. All right. Um, I, yeah, I, traffic enforcement officers have impossible jobs. They, they, absolutely, they absolutely have incredibly difficult jobs. And I guess my question, my broader question is, if the complaints are there and only 20% of them are actually turning into actual criminal complaints because people aren't going to file them, what, what's the difference if we... First, if we make it broadly a felony, if it's a question of further police involvement uh, with investigating them, then maybe that's a question for the BPD. But having said that, um, if it's also perhaps because it's harder to prove those things without some kind of additional evidence, then perhaps the body cameras would be helpful and pr provide more of a deterrent for people who would seek to do violence against TEOs because they know they were on camera, wouldn't you say? It's, it's something to consider, although I have heard, um, based on our research for this bill, that the body cameras, if, if the body cameras were, were equipped, or if we equipped our TEOs with body cameras, it wouldn't necessarily solve that. Um, now, we're willing to, to look into that further to get some additional clarity. Um, but again, I think our concern as a department with, with the body cameras is there would be a, a physical impact um, during times of scarcity, for lack of a better term. So we should raise the penalty to a felony and keep the penalty the same and not really try the cases in the first place or spend the money so that they can actually take video of these terrible things happening so that we can get them to stop? I think that we would be willing to um, 
work collaboratively to see if we can make both efforts work in tandem. But it's it's something that we can't speak, we cannot speak on behalf of City Finance Department today. That's fine. Any further questions? Delegate Cardin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Just real quick, if, if you, if there were body cams and body cams allowed for an easier prosecution of this, wouldn't it be the fact that you may get more restitution and possibly could there be actually some sort of damage clause for maybe, I don't know, Mr. Chair might know this, for the city to be able to recoup money so that it could actually reduce the cost of the body cameras based on the increased um, enforceability. It's definitely something we're, we're, um, we will look into further, Delegate. Okay. Any further questions? Uh, I see two. Delegate, you asked one already? Delegate Conaway and then Delegate Young. Oh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. After you took my two questions that I first had. Thank you, panel, for coming <laughs> in. Thank you, Baltimore City Delegation Chair. What is this, uh, what's the scarcity that we were talking about? Oh, yeah, I would just, I would just, oh, we don't have, yeah, I would say that, um, and delegate, great question. I, I would just say like each year our, our annual operating budget uh, with the city of Baltimore is, is razor thin and there are um, existing fixed costs and this would be adding on an additional fixed cost and it's just, it's, it's not in our area of responsibility. That's, that's something the finance department determines. It's not in your area of responsibility. Are you getting ready to take over the Baltimore City Police Department? I have no intention of doing that. No, is Baltimore City getting ready to take over the Baltimore City Police Department funding? So, my understanding is that is a conversation that is happening. You no, know, is your understanding that something that's about to happen? That that is my understanding. So then. It's possible that these special enforcement officers could hook into the Baltimore City Police Department's cameras or camera program, body camera program. So. And, and so you haven't thought about that logistically, so you don't know if that will reduce the cost and increase the safety? We have talked with Baltimore City Police Department in preparation for today's hearing. Um, however, I don't know if you know, that, that's a discussion we'll have to, to, to have further We're discussing thought. it right now. Can we do it or yeah. we can't do it? I mean, we, we, we've dealt with this special enforcement officers uh, problem, I think, mm -hmm. maybe five, six years ago. Mm -hmm. Even though on the fiscal notice says we haven't talked about it in the last three years. So let, let's make it safe for uh, people that are doing work in Baltimore City and make it safe for the police officers, make it safe for the citizens. So what, what is there to talk about? How much money do we need? So our estimate for our TEOs, we have roughly uh, 90 to 100 TEOs currently on staff. That would cost $270,000 annually. In addition to the Baltimore City Police Department program or if we add it on to their program? That would be in addition to it okay. because the, the, the police department has a body camera for each officer. We couldn't borrow what they have. Okay, true. Do they have uh, cameras in the cars also? The, the police, police department? Yes. I do not know. Are you planning on getting cameras in the police cars? So I just want to be specific. I'm with the City Department of Transportation, so I, I just don't know. Okay, so you're with the City Department of Transportation. Mm -hmm. Do you have cameras on the uh, uh, mass transit system? So... Yeah. M.MTA MTA does have cameras, but that's a s state agency. Okay. So we need to look at getting the cameras together with the Baltimore City Police Department and see what the difference in the funding would be. Is that correct? If you would like us to get that information, Delegate, would. we would be happy to. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Mr. Chair, quick clarification. Did I hear you say that Nina Themelis was on this panel? 
Yeah, she basically uh, signed everyone off. She, she said, so Nina, uh, we had a lot of questions that obviously the Department of Transportation just isn't able to answer, and, we, and it makes sense because they only work on transportation. Liam does a great job there. So if you could just help us with some of these answers, if you can. Namely, my primary question is, if we pass this bill, is Baltimore City prepared to pay for it? So, I mean, excuse me, clarify, not this bill. If we were to do the body cam, is Baltimore City or could Baltimore City be prepared to pay for it? So my understanding as far as the fiscal 24 budget is concerned, that's not a part of that budget process, but I think it's something that we would be able to have a conversation about. Um, it's, you know, a sizable cost. It's not huge, mm -hmm. but I think it would be something that we would have to include and add into the conversation where toward the end um, of our fiscal 24 budgetary process at this point. Is that something that you all had thought about prior to this bill? Yes, it was something that we had thought about. Um, primarily, we just want to right size and kind of put everybody, all of our first responders on the same playing field. So it's kind of two separate issues that we're having a conversation about. Obviously, we want to protect all of our first responders in the same manner. And as far as the body cameras are considered, it's something that we're definitely open to having the conversation about. Um, but it's something that BPD has only implemented over the course of the past few years. So it's still kind of an ongoing and growing technology. Um, so at this moment, we don't have it built into the fiscal 24 budget. Um, the last question is, uh, is there any reason why, if you have thought about it, why you all didn't consider bringing that this year? Thank you for the question. Um, so I haven't been a part of the specific conversation around like increasing technology for public safety. Um, I don't know if the Department of Transportation had had that conversation with the administration and that was included in their request for the fiscal year. Uh, so I would have to come back to the committee with a response to that question. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any further questions? Seeing none. Thank you very much. That concludes the Thank testimony you. You, for Chair. House Bill 613. House Bill 927 is next with Delegate Ruth, uh, Susan Pompa, Timothy Bradford, Eves Brady, and Elizabeth Hilliard to join her. And then we have a panel in opposition. You may need an extra chair. You may not. We're going to find out. You won't. And that's fine. So we'll go ahead, Delegate Ruth, if you'd like to begin for three minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, one of members of the committee, one of my favorite um, sayings, which I used to think was Albert Einstein, but I've since learned he didn't say it, is that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. We've been doing the same thing over and over again for the last 50 years of the so-called war on drugs, um, mass incarcerating people, um, and it's, it's not making us any safer, and it's not reducing addictions, overdose deaths, or the impact of drugs. Um, the research has shown that arrest and incarceration do not act as a deterrent to drug use. Um, since from 1974 to 2019, the number of people in prison for drug-related charges increased 1,910% from 11,200 to more than 225,000. Yet from 1999, the earliest year for which we have overdose data available, overdose deaths increased 547%. So clearly, the, the drastic increase in incarceration did nothing to prevent overdose deaths. Addiction is a public health crisis, not a crime. People with substance use disorders need treatment, not incarceration. HB 927 decriminalizes the possession of very small personal use amounts of controlled substances, making it a civil offense with a fine of not more than $100. Um, in addition to the fine, the court may refer people under 21 for substance use or mental health assessment and or treatment. And if there is a trial, it directs the, the court to direct that to drug court. I'd like to call your attention to the testimony that you have from the Maryland um, special Secretary for Opioid Response, um, who has submitted in support favorable testimony. I'd just like to quote from that briefly. Um, she's, uh, Secretary Keller says, the United States has criminalized drug possession and use for many years, and this approach has not resulted in fewer drug-related deaths or healthier communities. A study found that individuals being released from incarceration were 12.7 times, 12.7 times more likely than the general population to die in the first two weeks following their release 
with drug overdose being the leading cause of death. Um, so um, if, we, if we genuinely want to help people, it's time to turn away from these harmful policies which do nothing to improve public safety or reduce drug use and to treat addiction and substance use as the public health crisis that they are. HB 927 is one small but important step forward in treating substance use as a health issue and minimizing the harm caused by contact with the criminal justice system. I ask for a favorable report for HB 927. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee. I'm back. Um, <laughs> Elizabeth Hilliard on behalf of the Office of the Public Defender, and we are urging a favorable report for House Bill 927. Um, you're going to hear a little bit more broadly from Mr. Bradford about why we're in support. I'm going to speak a little bit about my personal and professional experience with addiction. I have actually represented a client who overdosed nearly immediately after being released from DOC. Incarceration is not treatment, and drug use and addiction is not a crime. It's a public health issue. Someone who is experiencing addiction cannot be bullied, cannot be arrested, cannot be incarcerated into treatment. They need resources, they need help, they need support, and they need to make the decision on their own to receive treatment. I know all too well that relapse is part of recovery and that recovery is a long road. It cannot be satisfied by drug court. It cannot be satisfied by time spent behind bars. It must be something that the individual and their care providers, their resources, whether they're choosing to participate in a program or another way of maintaining their sobriety, must pursue. We, as Delegate Ruth pointed out, have been trying the war on drugs for far too long, and it has not been successful. I've lost friends, family, and clients to overdose. We need to pursue treatment and not incarceration. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the Judiciary Committee, my name is Tim Bradford. I'm also with the Public Defender's Office, and I support House Bill 927. Over 50 years ago, Richard Nixon declared the war on drugs, hoping to solve the drug problem in this country through incarceration. We all know by now this policy has not worked. House Bill 927 is a start to change the mentality of us versus them and the beginning of us getting help for those that are addicted to drugs. It's time to turn this uh, from an issue, a cr criminal justice issue, to a health issue. House Bill 927 will significantly reduce or eliminate racial and ethnic disparities in convictions and arrests, which create stigmas that can affect people from getting employment or even reaching out for addiction treatment. House Bill 927 will allow money to be shifted from incarcerating persons to drug treatment. It's estimated that it costs over 60000 a year to incarcerate an inmate. The money saved can be used to provide more drug treatment for people that are in dire need of it. Finally, House Bill 927 allows the courts to refer cases to district court drug courts. As a practitioner, Lowe has attended five national drug court conferences and multiple state problem-solving court symposiums. The key to the effectiveness of these courts is getting people into treatment as soon as possible after the person's first encounter, which this bill would do. Members of the committee, I want to thank you for your time today and ask for a favorable, favorable report on House Bill 927. Thank you. I, when I uh, read the list of people who were seeking to, who were going to testify, I thought they were all here. I missed the two of them are virtual, Ms. Pompa and Ms. Brady. So we'll start with Susan Pompa now for two minutes, please, virtually. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the Judiciary Committee for having me today. My name is Susan Pompa, and I am the Associate Director of the Maryland Affiliate of the National Council on Alcoholism and Drug Dependence, otherwise known as NCADD Maryland. We are here today to offer our support of House Bill 927 to decriminalize the possession 
of small amounts of illegal substances. NCADD Maryland hosted an annual conference a couple of years ago, and the featured speaker was the Director for Intervention on Addictive Behaviors and Dependencies in Portugal. That country decriminalized the possession of drugs in 1999, and their results have been outstanding and astounding. This change in policy has led to such outcomes as reductions in illicit drug use among the overall population, reduced expenditures related to drug offenders in the criminal justice system, increased uptake of drug treatment, and reduction in drug-related deaths and the transmission of infectious diseases. The money spent on enforcing possession laws in Maryland would go a long way toward providing an adequate continuum of services for people with substance use disorders. And this would include prevention, treatment, and recovery supports. We could increase education and prevention programs, and we would ensure quality care for not only our young people, but people who have had long-term addiction issues. And most importantly, based on the experiences abroad, we would save lives. We ask for your favorable support of House Bill 927. Thank you. Ms. Brady, please. Thank you. Yes, my name is Eve Brady. I'm the chair of the Drug Policy Task Force for Progressive Maryland. Uh, Progressive Maryland is a grassroots nonprofit organization with more than nine chapters and 100,000 members and supporters across the state. Um, as an organization, we urge a favorable report on this bill. Um, now, I am not a medical professional, uh, so I would love to just let the, the lawyers and the doctors have their testimony. I would love to just dare, share a few statistics, though. Um, since 1971, the U.S. has spent nearly a trillion dollars on drug-related arrests, prosecution, and incarceration. However, um, and this is a stat from the Department of Justice, oh, almost 85% of people in prison uh, who could benefit from drug treatment just don't get it. Um, so as Delegate Ruth already said, statistically speaking, incarceration just hasn't worked. Um, overdose death Overdose deaths have increased uh, more than 500% since 99. Um, as a person who has family and friends who are direct targets of the war on drugs, I'm well aware that a criminal record, let alone prison, does not solve the issue of drug use disorder. Um, many testifying here, I'm sure, can tell you that drug users often stop themselves from seeking help specifically for fear of incarceration. Uh, enacting this bill will be the first step in moving drug use away from our criminal justice system and toward our health our healthcare system where it belongs. Thank you. Questions for the panel, Delegate Williams, then Delegate Cardin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Really quickly for the bill sponsor. Um, quick question. Thank you, Delegate Ruth, for bringing this bill. Um, I don't know if you saw the written testimony that was submitted by Meg Kai. They make a mention that, I guess, I don't, is this bill turning into a work group, or is that just an amendment that they're seeking? Yeah, thank you so much for the question, Delegate. Uh, we are working on an amendment that could be used to turn it into a work group, um, and, and I will submit that amendment to the committee for consideration. Um, I, I think it's very important that we move forward with something, and I know work groups are not always favored either, so we, we need to start saving lives. And whether we move forward with the bill as submitted or we move forward with a task force to look into this further, I just think it's important that we move forward, and I leave that to the committee's discretion. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Delegate Cardin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, um, Delegate, for bringing the bill as former lead sponsor of this bill a few years ago. Um, I, um, I just wanted to bring to the attention, and maybe you've, you've dealt with this or you've thought about it, but if not, perhaps you can go to a work group if you do set up a work group. Um, this is from the judiciary um, that says that as these, it turns, basically it turns it into a civil, a civil penalty, right? So as these are civil matters, there is no mechanism for enforcement of a court order to undergo substance use disorder assessment or mental health assessment or treatment. So that might be something to think about, if you, unless you already have a response, I'm sure you do. I'd like yeah. to defer to my panel on that. And then the other, the other comment that they said was that um, it, um, the bill requires uh, the cases to go to, certain cases to go like directly to a drug court, but um, these problem solving courts are intentionally voluntary and it makes them involuntary. And so that might be an issue that you faced if you might have to change the, the way that these um, problem-solving courts are, are established. Did you want to? Well, 
I think those were questions, and I can sort of try to address them in, in twofold. Um, the, the, my response to the first concern in general, right, if we take this into the civil world, how are we going to get people the help they need? And my response is that's why we have a healthcare system, right? We, we do not need to rely on the criminal legal system to provide people health care. We don't. We, you can have EMTs respond with resources on hand, right? You can have police officers respond with resources on hand. Community services, rehab facilities, treatment facilities. These are all things that can be made available easily and readily without any criminal system involvement. Um, and, 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 and in fact, as we, you know, we mentioned, and, and you've heard from the other panelists as well, freely without the stigma and the barriers that are put in place due to criminal system involvement. As far as the, the drug court mandate, I actually, I, I, and I, to be completely honest, may have misread it. I was under the impression that if you paid the $100 fine, you wouldn't be mandated to be part of the drug treatment program. Um, and, I, and I could have uh, misunderstood that, but I, I, I think we would be amenable to making the drug court treatment portion Voluntary. I very much respect your perspective, and I think you, you, you are generally correct with how you assess this. We just need to maybe get some buy-in from the judiciary or let them understand or be part of the work group so they realize we're taking, we may be taking away some of their authority, but that they might want us to take that away from them. Yeah, I, I, and, and, and I know Delegate Mo Ruth mentioned the task force. We are fully on board. Um, OPD is certainly in full support if this becomes a task force bill, and we're happy to have the judiciary involved, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Delegate and, and witnesses for coming in today. This bill seems to mimic what we've done with the uh, decriminalization and legalization of the marijuana. And therefore, I was approaching it from that perspective, not thinking about a work group or a task force. And I, my first question was, if a person is getting a ticket or a fine, uh, how, how does that work? A police officer uh, discovers a person has a certain amount of substance on them, some magic mushrooms or something, and then gives them a ticket. How, how, how does that work? Yeah. Uh, yes, I... Yes, uh, it's a civil citation. They would be given the civil citation right there and then. If they're right, under, right there on the spot? Yes. If they're under the age of 21, they would have, uh, it would be a must-appear citation according to the statute. Oh, must-appear citation? Yes. Okay. And if they're over 21? Yeah, it could be paid out before. Now, do they have to provide proof positive as to who they are? Excuse me? Do they have to show the police something that the police officer believes, uh, like a license or uh, age majority card or something to say this is who I am? I, I would assume so. Well, it's so. not an assumption because these are the questions that were asked with the, yes, the criminalization and, and civil penalties with the marijuana, same type of thing. For example, if the police officer uh, finds you have something on you that looks like a magic mushroom but might be something you picked up for a ground, off the ground and maybe you're selling fake mushrooms, how would a police officer know the real mushrooms from the fake mushrooms? Will they have test kits? Well, you would still have a right to a trial. You get the citation, you could pay it, or you could uh, have No, that's not what I asked you. I didn't ask you about a trial. How do you get to the trial without going to Central Booking? De um, delegate, if I may. Um, for, first of all, I'm not a lawyer, so I apologize, but I believe there are already provisions in the law for how citations are handled, and this would follow those, those normal provisions. Right. Um, in terms of your question about what if it's fake magic mushrooms or sure. real magic mushrooms, sure. um, so, so they would, the police officer would, if the police officer believed they had and I hate to use that term, magic mushrooms, but let's say they, they believed that they had a s small amount of controlled substances, they would issue the citation. Um, the, the person who receives the citation would have the option to request a trial, just like you can if you get a, a traffic ticket. Well, I was, I was actually trying to help you out with your bill, but if you're going to put me on a spot like that, how will the officer know if you have 200 milligrams or more of uh, methamphetamine. 
Does he have a scale with him? I mean, how, how will they know? And, and again, you could request a trial and go to trial and contest it. No, no, the no. He won't even be able to know, so they're going to have to take you to Central Booking to get the substance analyzed to see what it is that you actually have because it might not even be this. might be crushed Tylenol. But I thank you very much for your answer. Thank you. Any further questions for this panel? Seeing none, we thank you very much. We'll hear from those people opposing the bill now. And hear from Steve Kroll and Bill Ka Billy Katzen. Two minutes each. Just for those watching us at home, um, Delegate Moon has a bill coming next. It's 564. He is trapped in another committee, so we may be skipping that one to get to Delegate Phillips's bill, which may or may not be his first bill in front of the committee. All right. Mr. Katzef, please. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is William Katzef. I'm an assistant state's attorney from Anne Arundel County here on behalf of the Maryland State's Attorneys Association in opposition to House Bill 927. Uh, my, my focus is both uh, procedurally as well as philosophically. I've been in the office of the state's attorney now for 45 years. I can tell you that when I started, the penalties for possession of drugs, with the exception of marijuana, was four years. Marijuana was one. Since that time, we've reduced the penalties for simple possession to one year and in marijuana, uh, six months, uh, assuming that the amount is in excess of 10 grams. I don't think there is any compelling need to go any further than that, okay? I, I just don't believe, given where we were and given where we are now, that there is any compelling need to go beyond the current, current uh, thresholds. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I believe that if you had posed a question to the, the uh, proponents of the legislation, I realize the bill only focuses on the minimum quantities, but if you'd ask them, would you, would you favor the legalization or the decriminalization they were of, of these drugs, regardless of the amounts that they would probably say yes. From a, from a practical standpoint, uh, I do felony screening in our office. Let's so take, for instance, uh, the police officer uh, stops someone on a routine traffic stop. It turns out that person has a firearm. That person is prohibited because of a prior conviction for a crime of violence. That person is then arrested. Now, in this case, he has a de minimis quantity of, uh, of any of one of these drugs. How do I, now, if I write up an indictment, how do I put in the indictment an offense that is not even a crime? I think every charge in an indictment must constitute a crime. How can I include a civil, a, a civil infraction in an, an indictment where all of the other charges constitute crimes? What's the authority for that? Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen of the committee. I'm Stephen Kroll, the State's Attorney Coordinator and the Executive Director of the Maryland State's Attorney's Association, and I've been prosecuting cases since 1984 here in opposition to House Bill 927 and asked for an unfavorable report. The Delegate Cardin, the judiciary is correct. Second, in all my experience, the only people behind bars for these particular crimes of possession are those that have violated their probation. Judges, prosecutors, defense attorneys all bend over backwards to help. But what happens when that mother calls you and says, my son or daughter has gone through hundreds of treatments, done everything we could. Really, we tried everything, drug court, this court, this rehabilitation, and they're still stealing from me. They're still committing crime. There must be a carrot and stick approach, and there must be some punishment, and there must be a criminal penalty to try to get that person back to a sense of normalcy. And in doing so, that gives them the opportunity to, to do two things, do better and get the treatment they need. Every court wants people to do better. Every court wants people to do what? Go to treatment. That's our goal, and it will always be our goal. But there must be a criminal element to, in fact, say to people what you're doing is wrong. And for that reason, we're asking for an unfavorable report as to House Bill 927. We hear the cries of the victims and the mothers to say there must be some sort of punishment, and that's a wit's end. Thank you. Delegate Williams, then Delegate Boucher, then Delegate Kaufman. Uh -huh. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Quick question. Um, earlier, we were talking a little bit about uh, amending this bill so that it's a work group. If this bill was amended to a work group, would you still be in opposition? We never oppose a work never group. Never oppose. No, not a work group. We wouldn't oppose that. No, not at all. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for being here today. Carroll County has a successful drug court program. How many jurisdictions have a drug court program? 
And if this bill passed, would it cause harm to those programs are in existence? Well, I'm familiar with the Carroll County one because I've prosecuted a lot of cases out there. It was started by Brian DeLeonardo, now a judge, and he was a Republican, just to make that clear. And he has a treatment person on his staff, that's the prosecution staff, that helps people get into programs. Imagine a prosecutor from a rural jurisdiction trying to help people from the prosecution side. I don't believe this bill will affect it at all. I believe Brian DeLeonardo's way of diversion through someone in his office is the right way to go. Thank you, sir. We have drug courts in the Anne Arundel County as well, both in the district as well as in the circuit courts. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for what I believe will be my final question of the day. I have a question for Mr. Um, 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 thank you, uh, Mr. Kastoff. Mr. Kastoff, yes. Well, thank you for coming down, and thank you for what you do to um, protect um, the people of uh, Anne Arundel County, and you do happen to have an amazing coworker. Um, I wanted to just ask you that I am... Uh, I'm a little befuddled. I feel like I'm in two different worlds. You just heard Delegate Ruth say that during this time where people of um, that people are incarcerated, the the bit uh, the the drug use has gone way up. So to me, uh, to me, you say, oh, the penalties have been reduced, but to me. Um, I think that's a good thing because, as Dr. Phil used to say, how, how's that working for you? And it doesn't seem like the law and order approach is working. So my question is, do you have data that shows that after an incarceration, um, people are much more likely to be clean or, uh, and that incarceration actually results in uh, less, um, less drug use? Thanks. I don't have any data with regards to that. I mean, if you, I could certainly try to furnish you some, but I don't happen to have any at this particular moment. Uh, that would be great because you just heard Delegate Ruth um, cite data that, um, in fact, during the war on drugs, the number of people using and incarceration, uh, the number of people incarcerated has been used. So if you're saying it's such an important and effective tool, I would like to see uh, the data. Thank you very much. Sure. Well, the question, let me ask, let me just say one other thing. With regards to the people who are incarcerated, I suspect that the people that are incarcerated are those that, are, that have been convicted of felony offenses. I don't know of too many people. I don't think there's anyone that's in the Division of Corrections who has simply been uh, convicted of uh, possession, certainly not marijuana. These people, I think, typically have been uh, sentenced uh, to the DOC because it has to be more than a year in order for them to uh, be eligible for the Division of Corrections. Still Further questions for the panel? Delegate Conaway. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I can't say this will be my last question. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming in to testify today. <laughs> I gave an example earlier. I gave an example earlier about what I thought would happen if an officer found someone with a, a substance that they didn't know, that the officer didn't know what it was or how much it weighed. I was wondering if you could comment on how that, how that might uh, play into a civil offense if, if, if this bill were to pass. Well, I think, cur I, mean, wait, wait, I think currently with regards to marijuana, I mean, by and large, I don't know whether or not the police officer has a skill. Oftentimes, it's just simply a matter of perhaps looking at it, having some familiarity with, you know, the, the weight of marijuana, whether, it cuts, whether it's greater or less than 10 grams. Okay, then, of course, if it's less than 10 grams, it'll be a citation. If it's more than 10 grams, there, it may be included on a statement of charges. Ultimately, drugs have to be analyzed in order to determine whether they are what we allege that they are. So uh, when you get a civil offense, is there a statement of charges? No, if, it, if it's a civil offense, it's a citation. This, this is civil offense. Civil offense, it's a citation. It's a citation. So if, and I used the term magic mushrooms earlier because I'm not really sure what the correct term is for these mushrooms, but it says mushrooms. So if the officer... Like psilocin, I guess it's yes, psilocin. Yes, something like that. Like yes, psilocin. So if the officer believes that the substance are some, some of these mushrooms, 
how, how would he write up the citation, the civil citation? Well, he would charge him, I guess, either with what, psilocin uh, or psilocybin. I'm not. There are two different kinds. Which one? Both of them. Psilocybin, yeah. Okay. He would, the, the uh, officer, right now, it's a, it's a crime. There's no civil infraction, okay? It's a crime. So the officer would include that in a statement of charges, indicating that the person is in possession of, uh, of uh, psilocin, okay? And, and then the person would be taking the central book then? Well, not, necessar not necessarily. I mean, if the person is arrested on site, okay, then they would probably be, ta they would be taken to, say, the police, uh, to the police station to be processed. Uh, if, for instance, the, the, uh, the police opt to go a different route, there may be other charges, and they apply for a statement of charges, because there may be another crime, they, would, uh, they might apply for a, a charging document, and the commissioner would issue it. But if the, if the police officer were to determine that he or she is witnessing a crime, then they would arrest them and take them to, uh, uh, to the uh, station to be processed and ultimately to the commissioner's office. Okay, thank you very much. Further questions? Seeing none, we thank you very much. Okay. And that concludes the testimony for House Bill 927. We're going to skip Delegate Moon's bill and go to Delegate Phillips's bill. May or may not be his first bill in front of the committee. And he's the only person testifying. I'm not sure which we like more. Very really simple, Mr. Chair. Oh, really dear. Simple. Fairly simple bill. So we might as well, what, hour and a half? <laughs> How long we need? A delegate, let's only give him three minutes. Delegate, go ahead. All right, Chairman Clifford, Chair. And in his absence, Vice Chairman Moon and the fellow members of the committee, as I've heard people say, for the record, I am Delegate Phillips. House Bill 761 is a bill that should be moved favorable to remove a remaining vestige of slavery. Yes, I did say slavery. I'd first like to thank Vice Chairman Moon for bringing this, this section of the Maryland Code to my attention. Section 9507B of the Correctional Services Article enables Maryland state and county correction facilities to require male prisoners to work on public roads. Specifically, it states each male inmate of a state or local correctional facility may be required to work on public roads in accordance with sections 9508 through 9514. This bill would strike the words may be required to. While corrections as a practice may not currently require inmates to perform road work, the policy which allows it should be eliminated. Requiring prisoners to do road work is forced labor. Historically, this was referred to as convict leasing. Convict leasing goes back to the era of chain gangs. On this last day of black history, let's take a moment to reflect. Following the abolition of slavery, many states created new forms of involuntary servitude, prison labor. Under the so-called black code laws, African Americans were unjustly imprisoned for violating curfews and my other minor offenses. These laws were imposed exclusively on black men. They were chained together and forced to, do, to dig ditches and farm without pay. The atrocious practice of this chain gang, once exposed, turned public opinion against convict leasing as early as 1900. Nonetheless, today in seven southern states, Alabama, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, South Carolina, and Texas, almost all work by prisoners goes unpaid. It's not hard to imagine that's a vestige of slavery, said Jennifer Turner of the ACLU in her paper entitled Captive Labor, Exploitation of Incarcerated Workers. In Maryland, we must do better. According to the Cincy Project, we incarcerate black men at a rate of five to one, and over 50% of Maryland's inmates are African American. According to the ACLU Global Rights Clinic, for those working inmates, the national average for prison wages is 13 to 52 cents per hour. In Maryland, we pride ourselves as a forward-thinking state that is aggressive in eliminating racial inequality and preventing and preserving human rights. In a state that is one of the highest rates of incarceration of African-American men, we must do better. 
as a matter of policy and to ensure that Maryland removes the last vestiges of slavery, I recommend the removal of any statutory language that would justify the practice of requiring prisoners to work on public roads and reinforce the images of a dark past. I ask for the favorable report on HB 761. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Delegate Phillips, congratulations on your first bill. And as a freshman... <laughs> As a freshman, I would like to know, how did you manage not to have any um, unfavorable testimony? Good question. <laughs> I stayed under the radar. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> I think, did you say that they were getting paid 52 cents? Yes, yes. That's on average. The national average is 13 to 52 cents per hour for incarcerated individuals. Do we, do we know... Uh, what the state of Maryland number might be? Uh, the uh, corrections does not report it, and they have discretion as to how much they pay an in inmate. My, my, I think we know that they don't get paid more than $3 a day. Isn't that so? Isn't that so? Further questions? Seeing none, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 761. Thank you very much, and congratulations on your first bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> And while we're at it, let's now go to House Bill 747, Delegate Pasteur's first bill in front of the committee. She also doesn't have anyone testifying except herself. So let's hear from her for three minutes. Good afternoon, Chair Cliffinger, Vice Chair Moon, and members of the Judiciary Committee. For the record, I am Cheryl Pasteur, and I am here to testify in support of House Bill 747 for the purpose of repealing the antiquated authority of the Division of Corrections to arrange for inmates not needed or being used by the State Highway Administration to be employed in agricultural work during any part of the year at a camp in Queen Anne's County or any other county with a similar camp. This so-called chain gang bill is not only antiquated, but flies in the face of today's belief that incarceration is the consequence and rehabilitation is the hopeful positive result. This is real life drama with men and women from prisons doing agricultural work for no pay on for-profit farms in Maryland. In January, Vice Chair Moon requested an update on the original bill. In 1999, the Department of Legislative Services flagged this bill for repeal. Research by DLS staff has indicated that no bill has ever been proposed to repeal or amend this statute until now. In 1916, Chapter 211 Annotated Code placed language in the code that allowed the prisoners to work on road gangs in the state. In 1943, Senate Bill 285 repealed and reenacted with amendments the law providing for the use of prisoners assigned to camps in Queen Anne's County and other counties to harvest crops from August 1st to November 30th each year for no pay on for-profit farms. In 1999, this provision made its way into the Correctional Services article where members of the Code Revision Committee recommended that it could be removed as it was obsolete, adding that, and I quote, currently there are no correctional camps in Queen Anne's County and no inmates are being used in agricultural work as authorized by this section. It's time to repeal this authority before someone in Maryland uses it 
to follow the example of the sheriff in Arizona, one in Georgia, and Sheriff R. Ivy in Brevard County, Florida, who asserts that the chain gang is a deterrent that instills a strong work ethic in the inmates and is a part of their rehabilitation. My colleagues, I respectfully ask for a favorable vote for House Bill 747 before someone repeats this archaic authority of Thank the you. Division Thank of you Corrections. Thank you very much. Thank you. Delegate Eric Hand for a question. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate, for bringing this um, important bill. So um, you said it, that DLS had flagged this in 99. Back then, did we have something then that was happening? Or even, even in 99, there was nothing happening in Queen Anne's County? Right. There was nothing happening at that time. How strange. And that's why they flagged it. Because it was already obsolete. obsolete. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Nothing happened in those subsequent years. Yeah. <laughs> you know how they can be. Maybe we'll get it done this time. I hope so. Are there further questions? All right. Thank you very much. That concludes the testimony on House Bill 747. Making our way closer to Delegate Moon's bill, we may need uh, we may need somebody to stand in for him. House Bill 640, not her first bill. Victoria Venable, are you here? Victoria Venable from uh, Frederick County. Not unless she's online. Not unless she's online. Doesn't look like she's online. It's just you for three minutes, then. All right. Thank you, my colleagues, for making all of my points for me so I can be super, super brief. Um, thank you, Chair Clippinger and my distinguished members of our Judiciary Committee. I am, for the record, uh, Delegate Karen Simpson from uh, District 3, Frederick County. And I am asking for a favorable report to repeal the City of Frederick, uh, the Assignment of Offenders to Road Work, which is House Bill 640 just like was just brought up by Delegate Phillips and Delegate uh, Pasteur. In Frederick City, there was in 1957, that is when this, um, this law was passed, and to require vagrants or homeless people to be um, assigned to being do uh, road work. So, and we have not been doing that in Frederick City for a very long time. We instead feed them, clothe them, and provide them housing. And you will see that both the, um, the mayor of the city of Frederick as well as the county executive of Frederick have said, yes, please do repeal this um, piece of legislation. And I hope um, we can end slavery in Frederick and um, be able to move on. Thank you very much. Questions, Delegate Card. Thank you, thank you, Delegate Simpson, for the for the bill. Um, I, I, I really like these bills. I'm just curious if we. And I didn't have. A, I didn't really think of this until until in between Delegate Pasteur and your testimony. If people. If there's a prevailing wage that's being offered and people want to do work uh, as a way of passing their time in a, in a way that they, they can both get paid and they can have the support services that are required to do the road work, uh, make sure that they're protected appropriately, should we deny them the ability to do it or is this just repeal the requirement for them to do it if, if they don't want to? Um, we already do that. They go to career services if that's what they're interested in. That is not something that the court should be involved in. As, as an inmate? Oh, well, this is, this is this particularly is for vagrants, individuals that they felt is eligible to work and would pick them up. You'll notice there's no time limit I, of it either. So it would be like this is the life as you know it to be required to do road work. Okay. All right. I mean, this I'll, is I'll not the same... That's I, not. I'll talk it, to Delegate Phillips. Thank I mean, you. I do understand what you're trying to say is whether or not people who are doing, if you did a prevailing wage, but I think that's right. that I, bill, not this bill. Right. This bill is literally homeless people who are primarily men who are able, according to whomever figures that out, 
forced to do work and that it becomes life as you know it. I finished delaying. My delay tactics are working, so that's good. <laughs> good job. Yes. Yay. All right. So that Delegate Moon can come along and do the state as we know it. Okay. Are there further questions on this bill? Seeing none, thank you very much. That concludes the testimony on House Bill 640. Now we're going to go to Delegate Moon's bill. House Bill 564, which we skipped, and then we're going to Delegate Eric Ann's bill. But uh, Delegate Moon has himself and Vanita Taylor. Oh, there we go. I'm so sad I missed all the chain gang bill hearings, but oh well. All right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, the vice chair for three minutes. Um, thank you, colleagues. House Bill 564. This is a super simple bill. I think it might even just be a one-word deletion. Um, if you've seen anything about me by now, you should know I love to modernize the code and deleting other former delegates' past work um, is one of my favorite hobbies. I stumbled upon this um, bit of the code doing some research and saw that we authorized cities in Maryland to do a number of things, including banning vagrants. Um, this has obviously got to go. This is not how we do things today. Cities already have the power to ban vagrancy and homelessness by housing people and connecting them to services. And so a uh, explicit prohibition um, is a very antiquated notion. Um, just to give you a little bit of um, background on this, I mean, this is, you know, vagrancy laws have been around since English, um, you know, English uh, laws, and they came over to the states, and it, most states had used them against homeless people or unemployed people. Maryland, as in my research, had a very unique distinction. When we brought over the English vagrancy crimes, they were applied to freed slaves only, um, and this was their um, primary purpose. And over the course of the history of the U.S., these laws have been used to target political dissidents. Um, the Supreme Court finally struck down a Jacksonville um, vagrancy statute as being um, unconstitutionally vague in 1972. And the use in Jacksonville was against two white women who were caught in a car with two black men. What possible permissible purpose could there have been to that um, vagrancy. So anyway, um, if you look to the fiscal note, it basically tells you we don't need to do this. The um, specific actual acts that are causing a danger themselves um, can appear in the code as prohibitions, but you don't actually need to go after um, homeless people as a status crime. I think that's wholly inappropriate in the year 2023. So let's get rid of it. Good afternoon, quick and to the point. Um, being homeless isn't a crime, and we shouldn't treat it as such. Being homeless is an economic situation. Um, there are in Maryland in 2023, when they did a survey, I don't know how they did it, but they said it was 6,360 homeless people that they could account for in the state of Maryland. I think that number is low, but that's what statistically they came up with this number when I did some research. We don't want to incarcerate 6,360 Maryland citizens just because they're homeless. Um, we don't do that in any other legislation in the child welfare arena. Um, that is one of the areas that homelessness is not enough to make your child a child in need of assistance. We do not want to perpetuate the problem that happened with the 13th Amendment, which is right after slavery. Um, what we did in Maryland is we homeless children who didn't have anyone, but they found themselves they were free, end up being charged with vagrancy and being forced to work. This is 2023. This is really a cleanup bill that um, Delegate Moon found that when we did the Criminal Justice Reform Act that we didn't find this bill. But Delegate Moon, with his research, he found it. So it is now time to repeal it. Um, homelessness is, as I said, is not a crime. Delegate Eric Hand, Ben Bartlett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, to the sponsor, can you just tell me how many times it's been charged in the last 10 years? Uh, that's a good question. So this is, this would be, this specific law authorizes cities to have these. Right. 
um, laws. I don't actually know how many of them are still on there. MML advises there probably would have to be code cleanup. There were, like the Frederick example was the rare instance of this codified in state law. But again, I don't think this is widely used. Most of, because of the Supreme Court ruling decades ago, most of the um, jurisdictions trying to do this have had to clean up their act in certain ways and probably have moved to loitering and other sort of nuisance things. Again, those have their own constitutional questions, um, but this is a very simple code cleanup bill. Okay, and then did you notice in the fiscal policy note that um, there was a small business effect that the DLS had mentioned? They, there was some concern that it would have a negative impact on small businesses? Yeah, so they're in the fiscal note. They do mention um, what are you going to do about if there's a small business with um, homeless people there. Again, I would suggest this, this straight prohibition is not the answer. It's also unconstitutionally vague in my opinion. But again, if you look at the um, second page of the fiscal note, it also says a municipality may still enforce all ordinances relating to disorderly conduct and nuisances. So I think you, it isn't going to leave municipalities with no tools. Okay. Um, but again, it's just not, not a status crime where you're basically charging against so homelessness. What would the crime be then if, if a small business had somebody who was just camping out on, on the sidewalk, what would, what would the charge be? It would be loitering or trespassing. But what if it's on a public sidewalk? Like, like my a, downtown thing in Bel Air, like it's all public sidewalks. There's no, so small businesses come right up to the public sidewalk. They don't have property rights on that sidewalk. So let's say there was something like that set up. So what would the charge be for that? Why would you want to charge someone for being homeless and never on the street? I'm just asking. He said there was a charge that, that could be done. So I'm just wondering what it is. Not, well, as to the specific instance of, of a small business being squatted on by someone, yes. Is every scenario going to be covered? No. I, I mean, again, like I said, loitering laws could come into play. I think there's a – I have my own questions about the use of such laws, but there are other tools. Again, this – as to the crime of vagrancy in particular – this has all already been constitutionally suspect in the U.S. for a few decades. So, again, I really think this is just a code cleanup effort. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, um, Mr. Vice Chair, for bringing the bill. So, because we have the um, loitering laws, is your next act to repeal vagrancy in the statute? Or, because it still exists, right? Because it's defined. Right. The other way around. Okay. You're, you, you're asking if I would if I would later try to repeal loitering laws. No, I mean that is a, another. No, question this that is I actually had. most of the vagrancy in I think in the 80s. It actually, if you really want to know, it used to be all sorts of weird um, laws, and the one that stood in Maryland for a while was about vagrants and tramps. Tramps was the other, I guess, term of art that they liked to throw around for these. And it, you know, here Wicomico, if you want to. This is what these looked like. Wicomico, 1959. Um, anyone not being insane who has no visible means of maintenance from property or personal labor, who is not permanently supported by his friends or relatives, who lives idle without employment, everyone who is dissolute or disorderly course of life and can, cannot give an account by the means by which he or she procures a legitimate livelihood, every nomad, gypsy, or other person practicing that which is commonly called fortune-telling, um, gamblers, vagabonds, and if every person who habitually wanders about and begs in the limits of Wicomico or Somerset. There was a $25 to $100 fine or a mandatory two-month minimum stay in a um, state facility. Now, if you are homeless, I guess it would be, it would, you would get a two-month housing um, in Wicomico in the 1950s utilizing the vagrancy law. So that's what we're... That's what we're dealing with. But again, most of this has already been stripped out. I just caught a few glimpses of vagrancy discussion still left in the code and said, no, 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 we're going we're gonna to clip that out. Let's see. Any further questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Oh, goodness. Sorry, Delegate Conaway. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just, just a uh, thank you, Delegate, for bringing this uh, bill. Is it Ms. Taylor? That's yes, sir. Right. Could you give me that, that, that figure again? Did you say 3,000? 6,360. Thank you so very much.
Now, seeing no further questions, thank you both very much. That concludes the bill hearing on House Bill 564. Final bill, House Bill 937, Delegate Erican. If you'd bring up your panel, please. Mr. Kroll, Mr. Potashnik, Mr. Katzif, Mr. Joya. Ms. Lipscomb is here. No, it's not here. All right. The four of you. That'll be fine. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Uh, for the record, Delegate Lauren Arkin, uh, representing District 7B, Hartford County. I'm not offended that I'm the last person to go today. Last is definitely not least. Um, my bill is, I think, actually the most simple bill you've ever seen. I replace one number with another number. It goes from 30 to 40 years um, for attempted second degree murder. Um, I'll let my panel share a lot more details about it, but I just want to say we have the benefit in Maryland of having um, some of the most incredible trauma surgeons on the face of this earth. They are saving lives every single day. Um, if you are severely uh, injured in a crime in another state, you might very well die. But in the state of Maryland, you have a really good, a really good chance of surviving. Um, but I don't think that people should be getting off the hook with the crime that they were attempting to commit because our trauma surgeons are working so hard to save people's lives every day. Um, so uh, this, this bill simply uh, fixes what I think is, is a loophole and, and brings some parity to the, to the code. So I would urge an, a favorable report. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee, my name is Gavin Potashnik. I'm the, the uh, Chief of the Special Victims Unit from the Cecil County State's Attorney's Office here to ask for a favorable report on uh, House Bill 937. Uh, you know, clearly this committee put all of the bills that are most likely to pass last, and I agree with that. Um, and there's a <laughs> saying out there that um, the General Assembly is allergic to penalty bills. This is not a penalty bill. This is a parity bill. Uh, this bill... Uh, this, what this bill does is it reflects the seriousness nature of attempted murder in the second degree. In order for you to commit a murder, an attempted murder in the second degree, you have to have an intent to kill. It is not just another form of first degree assault, which is what most people think it is. And I think in order for us to make sure that we have parity with the remaining parts of the code, in order for this state to, to keep up with the serious nature of this bill, I'm urging this committee to do the very, very simple thing and just change that number from three to four. I am convinced this is nothing more than just an oversight from the General Assembly when they redid the JRA some years ago, and that this, of all the things that you're wrestling with this session, is something that should pass. So I urge a favorable report, and I thank you all very much. Thank you. Uh, Chair Klippinger, uh, Vice Chair Moon, distinguished members of the House Judiciary Committee. My name's Tony Joya. I'm an Assistant State's Attorney in Howard County, Maryland, and I'm here on behalf of the elected State's Attorney, Richard H. Gibson, Jr., and I want to join in the uh, call for this committee to please give a favorable report to House Bill 937. Uh, the process of, of legislation and drafting bills is complex and challenging. As a former assistant state's attorney in Baltimore City for 19 years, I have experience in bill drafting, and I know it can be a challenge when a bill is drafted to consider all other related statutes. And the JRA in 2016 was a beautiful piece of legislation by the Maryland General, General Assembly, a massive bill. And that is why we have a discrepancy today in the statutory maximum for the completed crime of second-degree murder, which is 40 years, and the statutory crime of attempted second-degree murder was 30 years. The fault lies clearly in all candor in the State's Attorneys Association, because at that time, we simply did not include 2-206 of the criminal law article, which is where attempted second-degree murder is codified in the draft bill that was ultimately passed by the JRA. The JRA did in increase the penalty for second-degree murder uh, to 40 years. That's 2 of the, of the criminal law article. What is, I want to use my remaining time to assure the committee that if you do give this bill, 937, favorable report, it will not at all encumber the sentencing discretion of any of our circuit court judges. It does not impose any mandatory minimums. It would simply have the same maximum penalty 
for attempted second-degree murder as for second-degree murder. And I would note that all other attempt crimes in the state of Maryland now already have the same maximum penalty for attempt for the completed offense. So I'm just asking for this outlier to be corrected. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kroll. Good afternoon, committee. I'm Stephen Kroll, the state's attorney coordinator for Maryland and the executive director of Maryland State's Attorneys Association. And I started with Mr. Joya, so I want to thank him for blaming the State's Attorneys Association back in 2016 for overlooking this. So I was in charge then, as I am now, so thank you, Mr. Joya, for all that. <laughs> Appreciate that. This is a cleanup bill, and it started back in 2016, and it was overlooked. So this is the definition of a cleanup bill. It is not a penalty increase. I want to make that clear, but we're just trying to remedy what should have been done before, and I guess I missed it at that time where whoever was in charge would have Stops with me. But I want to thank Delegate Erica for sponsoring this bill. And it's not a penalty increase, but a cleanup bill. And we ask for a favorable report. And we're happy to answer any questions. Questions for the panel? The Vice Chair. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I may or may not be interested in this bill. And I guess it depends on your answer to the next question. You said JRA cleanup. And it was music to my ears because I've been looking for a JRA cleanup vehicle to piggyback some other things that were um, left out of the JRA. And so I, I, I'm not joking, though. But, you know, like you, you say, this one was an, a, a, a flag, a 10-year gap. The crack um, cocaine um, volume disparities, I think, somewhere didn't get resentencing, didn't get kicked, didn't get included in the JRA. And we've been looking to pick it up somewhere. So I just, I, I hate to, to bargain in, in a bill hearing, but I, I just offer... Yeah, I, I just offer that there are other JRA items that were omitted that are very difficult to pull off as single-shot bills. And if you're open to that discussion, I might be open to this bill. Delegate, I'm certainly open to talking to you, although I can't comment on specifics since this is a very, very narrowly tailored bill. So mm -hmm. uh, find me afterwards and, and let's hash it out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just very quickly, um, Mr. Joy, it's always great to see you. Likewise. And not in court. It's nice to see you no. not in court because I always wor I worry when I have you on the other side. It always gets me nervous. Um, are you – I mean, get, based on what the vice chair said, that there may have been some overlooking in the JRA, are you suggesting that Mr. Kroll may have missed some other things as well as <laughs> this one? <laughs> No, not at all. I, I want to applaud uh, Mr. Cole for his candor with the committee. But, the, you know, the JRA was seriously a great undertaking, I, hundreds and hundreds of pages in length. And in the grinding legislative process that produced that great piece of legislation, certain things were left out. And Vice Chair Moon, I think you just have to see something in writing. But as a freestanding bill, this has a great deal of, of merit. This General Assembly considers and recognizes that attempted second-degree murder is a serious crime, obviously, because you've made it a statutory felony. Most attempt crimes in Maryland are common-law misdemeanors. So you have already recognized the seriousness of this offense by designated as, de designated as a statutory felony. And we were just looking for parity with the other attempt statutory uh, crimes that are already on the books. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and thank you all for being here and bringing this bill. Question, the last time we had a parity bill a few weeks ago, um, but some of the rationale for it had to do with public safety. I haven't heard any of that. Just asking, do you think this would make my city safe? Uh, so I'll tell you this. I have a case right now that I charged attempted murder in the second degree because it was a specific intent to kill. It was a domestic violence case. That involved a, uh, the abuser strangled the victim so hard that uh, he almost, almost killed her. And it was the heat of passion. It was absolutely that. She was saved by the quick thinking of the sheriff's deputies who responded in Cecil County. That's a, that's a classic attempted murder in a second degree. Mm -hmm. Had that sheriff deputy not arrived and that person had died, she'd be looking at murder in the – then this suspect would be looking at murder in the second degree, which is 40 years. But yet, because the – victim did not die, then they're looking at a 10-year discount if the judge so imposes the maximum penalty. Um, that is 
part and parcel of public safety uh, in a nutshell. And I don't see why you would have that 10-year discount simply because people live. Um, when, quite frankly, somebody living with crippling injuries as a result of attempted murder in the second degree, um, they, they don't get the benefit of seeing that potential for 40 years. So if you, Mr. Chair, if I may clarify. So in the initial example I was referring to, the witness who testified referenced how the change in the maximum would adjust where the individual would spend their time, thereby uh, acting as a deterrent to those individuals in the specific context of carrying illegal guns. So here what I'm asking is what change, other than the discount factor at sentencing, what change or deterrent value do you anticipate here, or is it merely, as you all have stated, just trying to level set the law? I think it's a bit of both. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, all sentencing for any type of crime, no matter what it is, on some level acts as that accountability factor, and on the other hand, acts as that deterrent factor. Um, so be that as it may, that's how this bill affects that deterrence. If I'm, if I don't kill you, um, then I'm subject to 30 years. If I do kill you, then I'm subject to 40 years. Um, and any other attempt crime in the state of Maryland is the same as the actual crime. So the same question you have would be some for, oh, I don't know, um, you know, attempted theft. Uh, if you attempt to steal something, you're still subject to the maximum penalty as if you actually steal something. Attempt is just the, uh, is the uh, beyond mere preparation, uh, almost completed act. So it's the same mechanism for every other crime as it relates to deterrence, is that you don't try to do it because you know you'll get the same sentence as if you actually did it, right. except for murder. Would you, last one, would you posture that, postulate, whatever the right word is, that the folks on the street have an understanding of those differences in sense. I cannot speak to the average citizen on the street, as that, and I'm sure to what you're referencing, I don't believe that everybody has a Rolodex of, of crimes going through their head, but it's, it's not about that necessarily. It's more about victims and making sure that they understand now, what I, they're getting. I hear that. Yeah. Just to conclude, Mr. Chair, I just always am worried about how if we change these penalties, how they actually have an impact on the street, if they have an impact on the street. Sure. That's always what I'm going to be looking for, but and I appreciate oh, your response. Just Thank to you so clarify, um, Delegate, the judges will still hold discretion in this case. So mm -hmm. if, Absolutely. You know. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Seeing no further questions, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 937. We thank, thank you. you all thank you. very much. Everybody. Members of the committee should be aware that today we had 65 witnesses and... 18 bills. Tomorrow we have 95 witnesses and fewer bills, and we on Thursday are presently set at 175 witnesses. Please be advised that these hearings will start to get a lot longer over the next week or two, and I'm saying that for, the, for everybody listening to at home. Uh, we will do our best to get through these, uh, these hearings as uh, as uh, quickly and as, as thoroughly as possible, but just letting everyone know. With that, it's before 5 o'clock, and I've dropped my gavel so that we can never leave. It's uh, 4.45. Thank you very much. That concludes the testimony today in the House Judiciary Committee.